Jay Butler. Mr. Butler, how are you today? I'm very good, my friend. How are you? Thank you so much for being here, man. It's no 8 30 in the morning. For those who don't know, we're here in England, 8 30 in the morning. It's freaking cold outside. <laughs> just uh, a bit. Just a bit. So for Jay, I got prepared a little electric blanket. How does that feel? It's comfy, mate. Yeah. I'm a big fan of the heat. And for myself, <laughs> I have this. <laughs> Yeah, I did order another blanket, so that's for my future guests. So, so for me in the future, that I'm not going to be too cold. Um, so you came all the way from where today? Uh, not too far, mate. Just in Farnborough, Farnborough. About tw- twenty minutes away. You're, clo- you're closer than I thought you were. Hey. <laughs> um, so Farnborough, that's um, that's about what is like fifteen minutes away from Bracknell. Twenty minutes. Yeah, twenty minutes. Yeah. Yeah, and um, when I was just checking some of your fighting videos, you were always announced that you used to rep- uh, represent that specific area. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And what was the name of the gym? Andy Roberts BJJ. Andy Roberts BJJ, where I went a couple of times as well, and it's really enjoyable. I really like that place. It's good, man. Let's go from the very beginning. So, if you can give me a little bit of uh, kind of background story about yourself, where were you raised? What school did you go? Yeah, so I was I was born uh, in Frimley, Frimley Park Hospital. It's about ten minutes from Farnborough, and I grew up in Aldershot, which is a military town. Mm-hmm. Uh, my dad was uh, a chef in the army. Did a lot in the army uh, when I did see him. Uh, and I grew up in Paul Road, right next to the, the uh, Aldershot Lido, the big swimming pool in Aldershot. I spent 90% of my life there. And then when I met my uh, wife, we moved to North Camp, which is right next to Farnborough, where her dad was living at the time. And then we ended up getting a house in Farnborough. Every time I seemed to move, I always moved closer to the gym. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, just make more convenient. And then Oh, yeah. What is it? One of the rules uh, uh, I was just reading in the book you suggested me was mm. try to get your gym as close as possible so <laughs> then you're not going to have excuse uh, to get out of there. And the book I'm quoting, I already forgot where is my little piece of paper. What was the right? Uh, the got, guy? got Fight by Forrest Griffin. Yeah, and uh, Forrest Griffin shares with a lot of cool information. Yeah. But we're going to cover that a little bit later. Um, there you go. And we have planes flying around. <laughs> yeah, you can hear them. That doesn't matter. Um, so how did you... What was the first uh, martial art you got into? Uh, I boxed. I used, to, I used to like boxing. I've always been fascinated with fighting ever since I was a young kid. Uh, I had quite a rough childhood. So I grew up sort of fighting. You know, I just didn't... Not so much the violence of it, but just the, the training, the aspect of getting yourself ready for combat, you know. So I started boxing when I was about 10 or 11 uh, in uh, Aldershot. And then I sort of left it, knocked on the head, got into football, played football a lot in sort of my early teens. And then uh, sort of later on in my early 20s, I got back into boxing. I started boxing in Basingstoke. And then uh, sort of mid-20s, that's when I found the glorious Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Mm. <laughs> when you said rough childhood, uh, what do you mean? Did you Were you surrounded by bullies or mm. was it your, ma- mm. it's your it was, family? Uh, or family, mainly my family. family. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't pleasant. Um, mm. You know, it was quite rough. Yeah. My source, my family, sort of a contrast, a mix of two different sides. You know, you've got a very successful side and a side not so successful, sort mm-hmm. of drugs and stuff. Mm. And uh, my sort of older sister had two children, which my mum took on, and sort of forgot she had me. Wow. <laughs> so at 12, 11, 12, I was sort of getting home from school. No one would be there, making my own dinners, spending a lot of time on my own. My mum would always be out with my uh, drug addict sister, so I spent a lot of time on my own. Grew up very fast, you know what I mean? Mm. And uh, it sort of toughened me up, sort of. You know, chiseled me into the person I am today. I can totally um, relate to that because I was raised with a father alcoholic mm. who was, as you say, would come home sometimes, there's nothing, and you need to make your food or whatever and try to figure out. And that made me uh, individual the way I am or independent individual yeah. way faster. And uh, I don't know, like anytime me and my sister meet up and we just like we're so actually thankful that that, that happened with us even yeah. though it's like you can't look back and say oh it's great that my dad was alcoholic <laughs> 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 but, but at the same time it was like we were comparingly with our kids and, and you probably can relate to that yeah the kids who had totally different issues I'm, I'm, i i don't I'm, i want to play outside i want to do this and uh, do that and me and my sister would do chores because my my, my dad wouldn't do it or and my mom was suffering like um 
from hysteria so she would like really dealt with um, she struggled so it basically was just me and my sister so yeah. yeah you grow up quick yeah you grow up because you don't have an option yeah what yeah. option do you have none none so. at all yeah and those things do you think those things can make you or break you most definitely it, it, you know it can do both you know it broke mm. me for a long time for a long time and I think finding sort of martial arts and jiu-jitsu I think that's why I put so much of my life and soul into it you know what I mean it I still suffer now, you know, yeah, obviously yeah. lockdown and that weren't great for me. Um, and Jiu Jitsu sort of my outlet, you mm. know, you know just, uh, just focuses me and takes my mind off everything. And st- I still hold a lot of uh, resentment and stuff like that. So you yeah, can be yeah, angry, yeah, yeah. you know, and there's no need to be angry anymore. But um, it's very, very difficult, very difficult. Yeah, because I think karate was for me kind of escapism. Like b- before I got karate, I just wasn't sports. Mm. The One of the things what I did was... I would not come home uh, until I've done all the sports school can offer. Yeah, yeah. I literally, I would uh, come home like nine, ten o'clock. I just didn't want to see my dad uh, mm. ranting and, and yelling at and my and my mom. Yeah. And so the the sports and any any uh, activities was just this escapism, just get away from reality, I guess. Yeah. And that that's again like that sort of helped me so much. You know, even now, like for stunts, it's good to know all to do all sort of stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, okay, and then you start with boxing. How long did you box? Uh, I was on and off. You know, I never took it too seriously. Um, you know, I did did a few years, stopped, and then went back uh, when I was older with a few friends, and that used to train in in Basingstoke. We did it like a couple of times a week, but nothing too too mad. You know? I mean, basically just to stay fit. I was a bit of a you know, love being in the gym. Keep again, keep just keeping myself occupied. Yeah, uh, channeling you know <laughs> that inner anger, and uh, I got into boxing and I got into going out clubbing. Being silly as you do uh, in my early twenties, uh, and that's when I met my wife, and uh, and then she sort of grounded me. She sort of ground you. <laughs> so that was <laughs> um, when. Um, so did, did do you remember as a kid? Did you get in like fights and stuff? Uh, yeah, I was never afraid to fight. Never, mm. you know. Um, I was bullied a lot. One particular bully. Uh, I'm not going to mention his name, but in second <laughs> in secondary school, I was. Um, I didn't go to school a lot. Yeah, you know I mean, I was always in and out of school. I never really bothered. I, f- I just had no drive, no, no, I had no support basically. Mm. You know mm. what I mean? Um, and uh, you know, I didn't have the best sort of stuff in school. Sometimes I wouldn't even get my hair cut for weeks, and I had long ginger hair. And hey. I, you can see that now. <laughs> hey, where's that? Where's that? Ginger hair. Yes. <laughs> A lot of people think that ginger hair is pretty hot and sexy. <laughs> I'm guessing your wife is one of them. <laughs> I hope she is. <laughs> um, so I, I would just look a mess, man, and I and I suffer for it. You know, no. kicked around and bullied, and um, we had we had this group of bullies that would just walk around kicking your bag and throwing your stuff everywhere. Yeah, and you yeah, yeah. Pick it all up. Fucking and, uh, assholes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, I was a very small, small sort of kid, and uh, I remember once I had, a, I had a really, I got a really bad temper. When I go, I go. So I see red, I don't, I don't stop. I had to yeah, see a yeah, count, yeah. counselor for it in my, when I was a teenager. Yeah. Again, probably because of my childhood. But um, I was at the back of the school. I used to go to Connaught School in Aldershot. And there's a massive, by the budgie cage, you walk out the back to go home. There's like a massive um, weeping willow tree. Mm-hmm. And uh, this particular bullet are like pulling off the, uh, the the leaves and stuff and whip us. Whip us on the back of the legs of them as we were coming out. Oh, shit. Uh, and he did it to me one day. Uh, and he picked the wrong day. And uh, I ended up tussling and wrestling with him and almost strangling him to death with the actual same leaf he was whipping me with. <laughs> um, that had to be pulled off by a teacher because I saw red that bad. And then from that day, he never touched never touched yeah. me again. How old you were? I think I was 14. Yeah, 14. And then, um, you know, I started hanging around with an old an old uh, friend of mine who was hanging around uh, in primary school. And uh, he was a, a big lad. Most, uh, the guy's the most popular guy in school. Mm. And he was probably, one, without doubt, one of the hardest men I've ever met in my life. So I always, me and him become really, really close. And then mm. from then I went from being, you know, this uh, sort of bullied kid to one of the top guys in the school, popular, you know, started enjoying school. It was only the last couple of years that I really enjoyed. I was pretty much there every day I could be. But before that, yeah, I was nicknamed the cancer kid because I was never at school. Just never there. Always, oh, always gone. You know what I mean? Is that why you get the cancer kid uh, nickname? It wouldn't be like if you would be bold and look sick. <laughs> I, I, don't I know. think it was just the lack that I was faking ill all the time. Oh, okay. Everyone thought, you know, he's oh, got shit. some sort of disease. <laughs> um, this is something that I'm not very proud of, but I, I got lesson. I, I got, you know, a good life lesson, and it, I, I still remember that. 
I was actually, I, um, I was never really attacked by bullies in school, but I was kind of a bully in the sense that I was bad mouthing. Mm -hmm. So th we had this one particular kid in, our, in my class who was quite crazy. Like he would, you say something at him, he would go straight away fight you, right? Yeah. But at the time, obviously I didn't know better. And as you know, kids are stupid. We are violent, <laughs> we, are, we are, it's all about, oh, oh, look at me, I'm the coolest kind of thing, right? So all it was, it was this one time uh, he wanted to follow our cool crew and we were like, had some snacks and stuff. And then and, and I said something to him and he just went ballistic at me and he knocked my tooth out. Adiel. And literally two weeks later, I started doing karate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that one spark, yeah, that, that gets was, you on the path. That was my, and, and now I'm not kidding you, for the next two, three years, I was like, fuck no, I know some moves, I'm going <laughs> to fuck him up. And it never happened. And uh, now I look back like, thank God that guy actually punched me in the face. Because, yeah. you know, and, and, and later you, I figured out and, you know, that he came up, he, he came out of like from very bad background and it was parents and and it was none of his fault so yeah there's um know. there's a quote from a film that i like the film rush mm. yeah, it's a film about uh nicky lauda and james hunt oh yeah, yeah i've yeah, seen yeah. it yeah, there's, yeah there's a quote in that that i think is absolutely brilliant and it's uh where nicky's in hospital and the doctor says it to him when james hunt's winning all nicky's races and getting all his points nicky says oh you know i'd say that bastard hunt winning all my points and the doctor says can i offer you a piece of advice and he says what's that and he goes um do not uh, do not think of it as a curse. You've been given an enemy in life. Think mm. of it as a blessing, because mm. that person changed your life. You started karate, started mm. doing what you were doing, and James Hunt drove Nicky to get better and get back to racing, and he won the world championship like a year later. You know, I mean, he used that that enemy, that yeah, person, yeah, to yeah. drive him instead of put him down. So sometimes you got to look at things like that. You know, what I mean, yeah, that was uh, that things. film was uh, with Chris Hemsworth. Yeah, yeah, I thought yeah. it was brilliant. Yeah, I worked yeah. with him on Men in Black. That's awesome. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> no, he's a lovely guy. He's a very lovely guy. Uh, it's a crazy joker. But yeah, that film uh, was very good. It was just about some sheer commitment and, and hard work and don't listen to what other people say. And yeah. when he came Do out you? with the burn, like those nasty burns and injuries, and he was just still pursuing and doing his thing. Um, that's definitely a cool film to watch. Um, Nikki Lauder. Oh, so, and then after boxing, um, I just got, I had something in my head, I already forgot. Um, after boxing, you went, uh, what was the next martial art you did? So I didn't do any martial art, I went to bodybuilding. Oh, really? Yeah, weightlifting. What yeah. was the motivation for that? Was just, it, just did to, you watch just Arnie to, films too many? <laughs> I love Arnie. Get Everyone the more chopper now. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you grew up watching Arnie, yeah? Yeah, Hero, yeah, yeah. the heroes and stuff. Um, just to keep myself occupied, man. I enjoyed staying fit, you know, and I enjoyed... Um, going to the gym so I, I, I literally just sort of started blitzing the gym with my friend like I told you become friends with in secondary school he was a big gym goer and it was just an outlet just to you know to look good women and stuff like that you know what I mean so yeah, I, yeah. I did that for years really and you know I got got really big my, my thing is if I um if I work out consistently I grow really really quickly yeah but I can't maintain it if I if I stop for like a couple of weeks I get bored easy I, sh I shrink really, really quickly. You're like the typical ectomorph, aren't you? Yeah. Like a body type wise. Yeah. For those who don't know, ectomorph is one of the three. So there's mesomorph, ectomorph, and endomorph. Mm. Uh, which one was the one who gets just um, muscly without doing much? Uh, is it endomorph or mesomorph? I'm not I'm not sure. But one of them is tend to be like quite, get quite big, like mm. as fat. Yeah. Easy to put up fat. Then is someone is in, in between and ectomorph is you. Mm. I think I'm the one who gets fat very easy, <laughs> 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 but I I don't struggle to put on uh, muscle. No. So that's that's the other thing. Bodybuilding, um, yeah, it's like th this one of those things like what we are surrounded by, like th these inspirations and what we think it's cool at the time. Because because yeah, I start doing backflips and throwing weird shit when I saw Jackie Chan's films. Yeah, you know? yeah, so, yeah, oh yeah. my god, he was so cool and he doing it. So I can, I think I broke my neck almost that one time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then so bodybuilding and then afterwards, what was next? So my thing was, is um, uh, when I used to lift, I used to lift a lot at home as well. I can't just, I even like it now. Uh, we even want to make a cup of tea. I've got to be watching something. Mm -hmm. So my phone, I've constantly watching jujitsu videos. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm getting the kids dinner. I'm showering the kids or whatever. I've always got something on in the background. So I used to watch... Uh, um, just make sure you're speaking exactly. microphone. You see, uh, that's yeah, what yeah, I was yeah, telling yeah. you about. <laughs> <laughs> you just get into it, yeah? yeah so no. I, I used to watch our, um, old boxing DVDs okay. when, I used to, when I used to work out. Uh, so keep me motivated, you know what I mean? Just just go, and that's how I got into jiu-jitsu, mm. which, which is a really cool story. 
Okay, go for it. Tell so me I, um, I used to obviously working out at home. Uh, my missus worked uh, for a company called SSE. What so age was that? Sorry. So that was um, quite late. You know, I met my, my wife now when I was 23. Mm-hmm. So I'd be work- I was working out until non-stop for two years at that point, not doing any martial arts, just working out until I was 26. And that's when I found jiu-jitsu. Um, but when I was watching old boxing DVDs, my missus had a chat with a, a friend at work. And he said, oh, if your husband, if your boyfriend likes boxing DVDs, he'll like this. And what does he give her? He gives her a UFC DVD. Mm. So uh, it was BJ Penn versus Matt Hughes when BJ Penn chokes out Matt Hughes. Right. And uh, he said, oh, if, you know, if he likes fighting this sort of stuff, he'll enjoy this. So she, he gave her the DVD. She brought it home. I thought, oh, I'll put it on, working out. And I didn't enjoy it. And then mm. I thought, what are they doing? Rolled around the floor, mm. like, hugging each other and all that sort of shit. And I was like, eh, it's not for me. I gave it back to her. So she took it back. And then uh, a week later, he said to her, look, if you didn't like this one, try this one. Mm. Okay, uh, and then I'll give up. I won't. I won't him. So he, he, UFC seventy, he lent her, which mm-hmm. was um, Gabe Gonzaga versus Mirko Krokop, where Mirko Krokop is like, you know, knockout artist with leg kick, head kicks, and he gets head kicked himself and put unconscious, like bad, like one of the fucking best knockouts I've ever seen in my life. And I watched that, and then I thought, oh, this, this is not too bad, you know, because it was all stand up at the time. And then uh, I put the special features on, and I found uh, a segment on Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I thought, oh, this is cool. And it gave a little bit of history, a bit of a background to jiu-jitsu. And uh, then I started getting hooked on the UFC. So I, I would just buy UFC DVDs, go to go to HMV, you know, all these other places and just buy up UFC DVDs. Mm-hmm. And it was more the, the special features that I enjoyed, the training, the people's lives, what they did, you know what I mean, to get mm-hmm, to the fit, mm-hmm. the mental training and stuff. And um, Yeah, because the journey is insane. I think one of yeah. the biggest part of things is that people don't realise what is the work Put all in the all back. people look at is the fifteen minutes you're fighting yeah. for. If it goes that, long. if it goes that well, sometimes yeah. it's just like it's like the, the thirty seconds. Yeah, someone get kneed in the head and like, oh, so what was that? That's not even show. What yeah. were you guys talking about? Um, and and everyone will judge you on that. Yeah. Not the months, the weight cut, you mm. know, the training, the sacrifice, the arguments with the missus because you've gone, you know, multiple hours a day, morning, noon, and night. You know, no one looks at that side of things, and that's what you should really judge someone on because the de- yeah. the dedication. You know, when you get a lot of people say, oh, "I want to, I want to fight MMA," and you did it like I, you know, I did it for quite a long time um, at a good, really good level, and you say, you know, if you're not, if you're not committed, forget about Mm-mm. it. Like, don't even think about it because no. one, you're going to get hurt; two, you're not going to get anywhere. You mm-hmm. know, and you've got it, it. It does consume your life. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. But that's the side I liked. I like having focus again because I think because of my childhood, it just took my mind off things. I like having something that I'm working for, and it drove me. And I used to train my ass off, man, like I do now. I just, I just can't stop. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, let's go back. I just yep. uh, took you aside where, uh, away from the track. You were telling about how you got into it. So you watched those videos? Yeah, so then um, I was working at a leisure centre in Fleet. Okay. okay? And I met a, a, f- a friend of mine, James Hardy, um, and he, he was into martial arts. He got me watching Pride, which is the Japanese version of um, UFC, yeah, which is mm-hmm. a bit more violent. You could kick him in the head when on the floor and this sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. So he become, become my sort of martial arts guru. James had been doing martial arts for years. And um, so we would uh, talk about jiu-jitsu. And he, and he mentioned to me one day that um, a guy called Andy Roberts mm. was coming down from Sheffield to start classes in Woking. He said, all oh, right, why don't you come right. along and start jiu-jitsu? And uh, I think because of my childhood, because of my anxiety, I did a lot on my own. I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I might come, I might come. A month went by. He was like, oh, mate, the classes are brilliant. I'm really learning and learning this. Every Sunday we'd meet up at work. He'd be telling me what he's doing. Then, then, you know, more and more weeks, he'd be like, come on, come down, come down. I was like, nah, nah, I don't really want to, you know. Mm, I am mm. I? <clears throat> and I put it off for two years. Two years I put this off for. So I turned 26. Uh, James had got his blue belt. Yeah, he was killing it. And he said, oh, you know, let's do some start to start this uh, training in, in a little combat zone we had in the Les Centre. So we started doing rolling once a week and mm-hmm. doing a few bits together. And I was enjoying it. But I still didn't have the confidence to go to a class with lots of people. And uh, he said, Andy had then just uh, at this point opened up a full-time academy in Cove, right by my flat where I lived at the time with my wife. And uh, James said, Look, I've got a key, I teach there. Come down, just me and you, and we'll get a feel for the place, and we'll have a little roll. Got destroyed, obviously, because James is actually brilliant at jiu-jitsu. And, um, you know, uh, this was on so like a Sunday, and he said, oh, you know, there's a class of beginners on a Tuesday, won't you come down? Mm. And I was just like, do you know what, I've got to bite the bullet, because I really enjoy training with him. So I went down the Tuesday, I was your typical, you know, out of shape, uh, white belt, didn't have a clue what I was doing, this big baggy gear on, running round. <laughs> Doesn't I, look sexy at all. <laughs> no, it's not flattering, yeah. <laughs> you know, and um, I did the class and I remember getting back to, um, we were living with my missus' dad at the time, because my missus was pregnant, and um, 
Yeah, we were. I laid on the settee, and I was like, "I ain't never doing that again." That's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Mm. No touch. I was gassed. What harder than bodybuilding? Definitely, <laughs> definitely, yes. <laughs> and um, all those who do bodybuilding, you think it's hard? Try BJJ. <laughs> and then, um, and then my phone rang, and James phoned me after his class. His class was straight afterwards, and he said. Um, he goes, oh, did you enjoy the class? I said, mate, yeah, it was really good. I said, I'm knackered. He goes, um, I'm teaching tomorrow night. I teach a beginner's class after night. When you come down, it's like, mm. all right, I'll come down. So I went down on the Wednesday, and uh, we did an hour's class, really good techniques, and it was good to obviously have James in there because he gave him a confidence. And then um, at the end of the session, James says, I, I stick around, just let, let the white belts roll for half an hour, let people train, you know. And I was like, oh, okay. I did my first roll. And that was it. Something just clicked. Something just clicked with me. I was like, oh my God, I love this. This is brilliant. Nice. And then at that time, it jiu-jitsu wasn't like it is now. You know, uh, I mean, you've been to Andy's. It's like every time you turn up to class, it's like, you know, good 12 black belts on the mat. Yeah, yeah, At yeah. this point, Andy wasn't even a black belt. It was a brown belt. The mm. highest grade I had to roll with was a one-stripe blue belt, which was James. Mm. So it weren't like it is now. You can walk in, oh, there's a purple belt, there's a brown belt, there's a black belt. Purple belts were like unicorns. Yeah, you just didn't ever saw them. You know what I mean? They didn't exist. Like trying to see a, seeing a purple belt was wait, like wow. Wait, 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 wait! I had a noise for that. Say that again. Purple belts. Again. Purple belts were like unicorns at that time. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so it wasn't like it, like it is now. We didn't have the classes every day. Mm. So there was no Monday class. There was no Thursday class. There was just no day classes. There was like a Tuesday beginners, Tuesday advance, no gi on a Wednesday, beginners on a, on, on a Wednesday, Friday, and then one Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. So I signed up immediately, and then um, I just did every class I could, everything. So I would do the beginners on a Tuesday, jump straight into the advanced class, warm up, and do that for an hour and a half. And uh, at this time, I was working. Um, I said I was working at Les Centre Fleet. It was either six fifteen till three or three to eleven thirty. So I would do double shifts on the Monday just so I could have Tuesday off and train more with James in the day and do whatever. Mm -hmm. and I did this for years. So I worked every Saturday night through to Sunday morning just so I could train in the Saturday morning class. So how long class. was this? No training. No, how long was this when you started BJJ? Uh, two thousand eight. Two thousand eight. So I started. Uh, I officially started with James in two thousand eight, rolling in the combat zone, mm -hmm. and I signed up at Andy Roberts in two thousand and nine. Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. early two thousand and nine. So that's when I sort of really hit hit you know hit home for me. I, I found something that was, I just got obsessed with. And then um, the good thing about James was he was an instructor. It was him and Andy. They were mm -hmm. the two people that were teaching at the time. And uh, he used to teach his Wednesday class on me, so I used to be his body. So I, I learned an awful lot just by you know what I mean. Oh yeah, hundred percent. And then um, yeah. a couple of years rolled past, and um, uh, James said uh, mentioned Andy about me teaching. And then he said, yeah, I want to open up more classes. School's getting bigger. We'd moved into the property next door to where we were. And uh, and he gave me a class. And I remember it was uh, Monday night because we wanted to start Mondays. And I had three people turn up to my class. Hey. Uh, it, was, it was brilliant. But within the space of three months, it grew so big. Andy had to move me from one side of the academy to the other because I'd taken up so much space with the people, mm. people that I was... Um, uh, teaching and stuff. And then, yeah, I've been doing that since 2010, teaching for him. There you go. Nice Everyone man. can see the. This is the gym, Andy Roberts BJJ. That's where you teach, and it's one of the gyms, right? One of so the gyms I teach at. Yes. How many gyms you're teaching I at? Well, I teach, the, I teach the gym we now. met was yeah, Pride. Pride, Pride Combat Athletics, and North Twelve Martial Arts in London. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. So three gyms. Three gyms moment. now. Yeah, I mean that's more. Uh, f you know, uh, teaching for David David Anuma. He's a huge name in UK Jiu Jitsu. He's like the Jiu Jitsu guru. His mm. man, that guy, one hell of a guy, man. He's instructor, person. He's uh, helped me a lot in the last two years, a lot mm. with my jiu-jitsu, my personal life, everything. You know, he's just been he's been really, really good to me. So he owns a school in uh, North London, which he, I teach at once a week, which is absolutely brilliant. And obviously, I met Martin through Camille at Pride Combat Athletics, and that, and you know, Camille was teaching jiu-jitsu, and he said, "Oh, you know, basically, I PT'd him once there." And Camille said, "Do you want a job teaching it?" And I was like, "What?" Hey. <laughs> and he introduced me to Martin, and Martin's one of the nicest blokes I've ever met in my life. You know, what I mean, he's so nice, such a nice bloke, and yeah, it's just you know. Andy's is the, where I teach the most, but the other schools I love just as much. You know, mm. I mean, all the people got to meet you. you hey. know, this is always a bonus. Hey. Um, you know, and um, meeting new people. I just love teaching, man. Absolutely obsessed with teaching. I remember when um, I got my first stripe on my white belt years and years ago, and I went home. I was so happy. Just this little, you know, <laughs> little tag on my white belt, and I was thinking I'm a pro. And I said to my wife, I said, you know what? I'm going to make a career out of this one day. This, hey. is, this is what I want to do for the rest of my after life. After you got your first one, little first, stripe. I know probably millions of people have said this, yeah? 
And um, she was the only person that said to me, I have no doubt. I have no doubt that oh, you will. Wow. And here I am now, and this is what I do full time, teaching people. I've gone from fighting in, you know, uh, little dingy leisure centres in Andover to the Barclay Card Arena, the O2, you mm. know, and stuff like that. Uh, MMA, Jiu Jitsu, you know, and it's taken me some amazing places, and I've got to meet some amazing people. And all that's just been because I've been so obsessed with it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, we're going to definitely talk about mo your fighting career more. Um, but also, that just the beginning. I, I love when you said about the white belts. It's just such an interesting concept. Anyone who is wearing white belt, they just look like they're not... They, they're lost. Yes. Like, yeah, yeah. what they wear, how they look, how they act. I was like... I don't know what I'm doing here kind of thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like It's like lost in the woods. And and I mean, for me, it's been uh, not even a year. But comparing to how I was in the first couple of weeks and how I'm now, it's like just... And, and when you say... I think this is the greatest thing about BJJ. For some reason, we're just so want to help each other yeah this is yeah. this weird thing like when you because i've done striking martial arts uh, uh, taekwondo karate kickboxing when you do those it's like oh i need to be better than you because i'm gonna mess you up and yeah. la 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 here's like i want you to be better because I, then i will have more fun to roll with you yeah because yeah, if definitely you, yeah because if you're not good you know then what's the point for me to come and uh, then i'm never gonna grow because that's the whole idea for us to get better yeah and uh, even, you know, uh, after this little period of time, if I see someone just totally fresh off the boat, uh, <laughs> no, just totally fresh <laughs> in this martial art, I'm just so keen to help them and show them and, and, and you know, hope that they're going to get better and they're going to come back. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, listen, this is our first segment. We're going to move, uh, we're going to have a little break now. And we're going to be back in a second. <laughs> little music. Hey. Oh. So we talked about... Uh, where are you from? And um, how is your traveling? Have you traveled much? No. no <laughs> you're going to open a can of worms now, mate. This, this, this is a funny story. Is I'm basically the Mr. T of Jiu Jitsu guys. I don't fly. Oh, shit. Yeah, shit. I'm, I'm terrified. I've, I've been with my missus 16 years nearly and we've never flown. Wow. On our, on our honeymoon, we had to get the Eurostar to Paris for the week. Oh my God, the tough man, the black belt, the yeah. fighter, can't get on the flight. No, no, so what is the story behind it? Why, why so, are you? Um, <laughs> before I met my, my missus, we went on a uh, two-week bender to Kavos with the boys. Yeah. So two weeks of just silliness. And uh, I wasn't the best of flyer anyway, but I would fly. Yeah. And uh, we were coming back from Kavos and uh, I went for a, a nervous pee, should I say? Yeah. And uh, I'm coming out of the toilet and I'm walking down the aisle and all of a sudden the lights go out and the plane drops. I mean, drops. I thought that was it. So yeah. I end up pretty much three seats of where I should be sitting. Alarms are going off. Gas masks are coming down. The lights are flicking on and off. Uh, people are screaming. The captain called as a cucumber. You know, we've experienced technical difficulty. Please stay calm. Uh, I'm going to level us out. So he had to drop to 10,000 feet. Apparently, it was something to do with air pressure in the plane. That's why all the alarms are going off. Right? And um, I'm cacking it. I'm with all these big men that I've been on all day with, you know what I mean? The, the lads and they're all cacking it. And um, I get back in my seat and I'm scrambling, tying up my seat belt as tight as I can and basically praying, kissing my ass goodbye. And uh, uh, we end up, he ends up getting on the um, the mic and saying, you know, everyone calm down, absolutely fine, strap in, we're in for a bit of a bumpy road, but we're not going to make England. And I was like, well, where the hell is he going to fucking put us down? In the ocean or what? what's going on? Yeah. And you've got no one to ask questions. You want to know what's going on, obviously, you know what I mean? So he levels things out the air pressure equalizes in sort of the cabin. Everything seems to be okay. So we had to land in France, okay, because he didn't want to risk flying just in case anything else happens. Yeah. So I landed. Ended up being something silly, something to do with a panel or something. I don't know technical terms for it. But it was how calm he was. You know, calm down, everything's fine. You know, yeah, the jaws yeah, are deaf. And uh, so we land in, in uh, I think it was Paris we, we stopped. And uh, hours went by. They started uh, distributing different people on different planes to get them home, this, that, and the other. And then our slot come up. And the boys were like, right, let's go. And I was like, no, no chance in hell am I getting back on one of them freaking things. No chance. And they were like, well, I mean, this was the weekend. We've got, we got work on Monday. I've got, I've got to get back. I've got to get back to this. I've got to get back to that. I was like, <laughs> I was like you go. My ass is staying in France. So I had to um, uh, stay in the Garden Nord 
to wait for a Eurostar, but it was like a day later. Yeah. So I was a bit like uh, Tom Hanks in the terminal or sleeping <laughs> sleeping in the garden. I literally on the just bed. watched that film just <laughs> recently. <laughs> that was me for a day until I could get the Eurostar back home. And then one it of would the be boys funny that they all just speak French to you and you can't speak any <laughs> language. But this was the type 2005. There's no Facebook, no iPhones, oh, no entertainment. That was yeah. 2005. Yeah. And there was literally nothing I could do. I was sitting there bored. All I did was eat, pretty much. And, mm. and that, you know what I mean? I sat up through the night watching trains go backwards and forwards that I couldn't get on, could never ticket for. And then, and I, since and I then, got, you haven't flown? Never flown since. Even thinking about it scares me. Wow. Yeah. That's something. Do you think that's something would you like to tackle? Oh, definitely. You? Definitely something to overcome because I want to I wanna go abroad. I want to train abroad. Yeah, yeah. My, my goal is I've, I'm fascinated with New York. I've always wanted mm. to go to New York. Mm. I've been in New York. Yeah. My, yeah. Miss, my missus has been there. Uh, I want to train train New York. I mean, you've got some of the best gyms. New York in the has world. some yeah. of the most amazing gyms Henzo's, as far as I know. Yeah. Marcelo Garcia's Unity. I want to do that. The, the, the tripod. I want to do yeah, all three yeah, of them. Yeah. And shopping. I want to take my missus shopping and that around. Well, I want to go just me and her without the kids. So yeah, you know, it's definitely something I want to tackle uh, in life. But a lot of people say to me, "Yeah, you know, missing out on so much." And yeah, I understand that. But I'm happy. I'm happy in the UK. Yeah, yeah. I, I love this country. You know, what I mean, when I used to um, in my earlier days when I lived in Germany. Um, we used to I used to commute back because I wouldn't fly. It's like a twelve-hour drive. Mm. <laughs> I was like, my brother was like, it's taking an hour on the plane. I was like, yeah, now I'm, I'm going to drive. Thank you. Twelve hours. I've sit in a car, knowing I can get out at any time. You, so you lived in Germany um, after that happened. After that, before um, it was before this hap- before that happened. That's how bad I was. Uh, sorry. Um, so you were yes. afraid even before that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. you, you never liked flying. And I was never keen on it. But that, that <laughs> sort of sealed sealed the deal for me not to get on one oh again. You know, I would get on one, but if I had the choice to drive or anything like that, I would do it. So I did it. I, yeah. love, I love to see that how some people can be so amazing and so strong and powerful in certain thing and then something else. They just, just crumbles. Like, them, yeah, yeah, they just yeah. crumbles. And, and that's it. Yeah, that, that is, is insane. It. Like, I, I love flying. I love, I, I've done uh, hundreds of uh, skydiving jumps. So yeah, I yeah, love yeah. jumping out of the plane. And the funny thing is, I actually wasn't very good with turbulence myself. Like every time the turbulence is, and, th- and then I'm just like, okay, I'm gonna die. But then, <laughs> <laughs> but that 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 feeling, that helplessness, because there's nothing you can do no. about it. And you, you just go so, sit there and watch it happen. And it's almost like when I went for uh, doing my skydiving uh, certification, I thought, how about if I always would have my my can my parachute with me? You'd feel so I would just feel, feel so better. much better. Yeah. <laughs> it would do nothing for you. <laughs> no. that's, you know what I mean, <laughs> the but, shit goes down. It yeah, goes yeah. down. Do you know what? Since my missus has done a skydive, like fair play to her for my boys' charity. Yeah, and um, she, you know, she said how amazing it was. She'd never do it again. Miss how amazing it is. And uh, but I said, do you know what? I could probably build up the courage to do it if it was over water. Not yeah. that, not that it would make an ounce of difference no. when I hit the water. Yeah, but it's it would, even but more dangerous. Just yeah, just mentally. Because I'm doing it over water, I thought yeah. well, I've got something softer to yeah. land in. I think I think me. before that, you just need to do a high dive from 15 meters to, for you to understand that water is not going to make you no, any good. No, no, I have. I used to do, uh, in my summers when I was a kid. I used to obviously I used to go away and spend um, my school summers in Cornwall with my friend David because I didn't want to stay at home. Yeah, and then we used to do like a uh, lighthouse jumping and stuff like. I love that sort of stuff. Like, oh, okay. I'm, I'm okay with heights, like jumping off of things like that. Um, but yeah, planes, nah. I'll avoid that, thanks. <laughs> yeah, but what is the highest you jumped in the water oh, from? I, I couldn't tell you. Quite high. Yeah. yeah. I, I've done from, in Bali, I did from 20 meters. Yeah, that's high. It feels like you jumping off four meters on a concrete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's how it feels. <laughs> Trust me, it's not, not a good feeling. But um, going back like about uh, the, 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 the things, like, I remember when I was flying to Hawaii, uh, on the way there, the turbulence was horrendous. This lady, uh, flight attendant, she was walking around. Oh, anyone wants to have free drinks? Like it's it's on a house. Just have. I had like I don't know ten whiskeys, like little whiskey <laughs> bottles, and I was like, at least I'm gonna get drunk and die. I don't give a shit. And uh, so we landed in Hawaii, and I'm just quite tipsy, passing by the captain who just poked his head out, mm. and I was like, listen, listen, um, <laughs> from ten to one, how crazy was it? I'm not kidding you. He gave me straight face. Yeah, I was barely four. I'm like, what is seven? What is yeah, eight? Yeah, then? yeah, right. Yeah. And then, and then this is the thing. Like a lot of us, we just don't understand what is supposed to be dangerous and what is, you know, how bad it is. Yeah. You know, we just in our head we assume, oh, it moved a little bit. That's it. That means we're gonna go uh, down. So, I mean, that's and that was the thing, the fascinating thing when um, I thought ours was a ten. You know, mm. what I mean, the, the gas masks were down. Mm. Like, the, it was windy in there. Like you were panicking. 
and uh, the captain on the on the microphone. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we've experienced some turbulence, slight technical difficulty. I was like, this dude is cool as hell. Yeah, he was probably that, high on some drug. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, knowing that he's on his way out, that's it. <laughs> but I tell you, the thing that scared me the most, and this is this is true, is not the fact that I was going to die. It was the look on other people's faces, mm. like the terror in other people's faces. Doesn't help, like, does it? No, not at all. That was oh my god, this is it. I am brown bread. It's game yeah. over. I think at one of the flights I also down. The turbulence was not too bad. I had people crying yeah. and 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 praying yeah, and yeah, all that yeah, shit. Yeah. I was like, calm the fuck down. This is nothing. <laughs> wow. Well, listen, you need to figure out how to tackle that. Maybe you know what would be a cool thing for you to try. Uh, do the glider. Uh, the glider is like there's doesn't have an engine in it, hmm. so they pull you up yeah, and yeah, then yeah. you just glide. I yeah. did it in Spain from four thousand feet, and it's amazing feeling hmm. and just how how the plane goes. But I think it just yeah, kind of try to maybe I other think what, what I need to do is um, I could be possibly competing in Ireland in the new year. Yeah, and Ireland's quite a simple, easy flight. But I'll be going with the lads now, mm. the guys I train mm. with. I think they that could would, hold your hand. Yeah, pretty much, yeah, 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 <laughs> definitely. I think I think that would give me confidence. You know what I mean? <laughs> Cam, Connor, and Tom would let me bottle it. They'd be like, "You get on this plane, and that's yeah. it." You and know what I mean? As, as you leave, Captain is like, "So w- what's going on? Like, how come this guy? He's just like, is he like very weak in general? No, he's amazing. BJJ crazy guy. He's gonna pe- beat you up, but he's afraid of flying. <laughs> this, this is it, man. This is it, Mr. T. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I didn't know that about Mr. T. Is yeah. it like in a film or yeah, it's in, in the A Team in life? In, 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 no, no, it's, it's in in a TV series. It was uh, in the 80s, the yeah, 80s. Yeah, yeah. So every time they want to get him on a plane for a mission, they have to drug him. Oh, you fool! Yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah, getting yeah. on, fool. I ain't getting on a plane. <laughs> that's all I get when um when planes are mentioned with the boys. You know what I mean? Oh, uh, that's funny. Okay, let's talk some serious stuff. Uh, let's talk about your uh, fighting MMA. How was the first? Uh, that how did you make that first decision? I'm gonna do uh, MMA fight, and that was already when you did BJJ, right? Yeah, I was a blue belt at the time. Okay, you were yeah. blue belt BJJ. So, um, well, did you do gi and no gi like equally, or uh, no? Was I was more, more of a gi guy. Yeah, when I and I think started. at the time everyone was more of a gi yeah. guys. Yeah, that was because the no gi is like what last five years? Yes, blown up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's overtaken massively. Yeah. yeah, big time. And do so, you think it blow up because of MMA? Yeah, yeah, obviously training no gi for MMA is relevant, but I think like people, personalities in jiu-jitsu, like Gordon Ryan, Gary Tone, all these guys that mm. people people want to watch, tournaments that have, um, you know, like EBI and Polaris and stuff like that, Grapple Fest especially, because Grapple Fest won't allow any gi matches. Mm. I, love, I love Chris Thompson, man. Um, which is, you know, I think no gi people can, that don't do jiu-jitsu can watch it and enjoy it, mm. whereas if you don't understand what's going on in the gi, it can be very boring, yeah. even for... A black belt and a grappler. 100%. You can watch sometimes, you know. Don't get me wrong, there are some gi grapplers out like Tommy Lanaka. For me, I could watch that man do gi all day because he's just phenomenal and, yeah. he, and it's entertaining. You know what I mean? And that's the thing, like, with, um, you know, how back in the days with the, all the blood sports and all the Van Damme films, it was about split kicks and about beautiful landings and all that. And then if you, on the contrary, you would show someone's uh, two guys are rolling doing a gi or no gi, like, that's boring. Yeah, what is yeah, this? Yeah. And I think that, that this is just my opinion. Again, I'm not, and the thing is like, I've never really followed that much of an MMA and UFC. Uh, you know, I'm honest with you. I'm more of the guy who just tries to do things instead of watching how other people do yeah, those of course. things. Yeah, yeah. But obviously I've seen some, you know, some of the greatest fights and I can really appreciate that. And then uh, when you, even when f- some of the biggest MMA fights, when you see them just getting down straight away, grappling, and s- one is choking, the other person gets an arm, arm bar, and you're like, oh, this is boring, this is not fun, right? But then when you get your head into this, like I started BJJ myself, I'm like, oh, wow, that yeah. is... that is." You appreciate it for yeah. what it is. You know, you can tell a well-ed- well-educated crowd in an MMA event, when it goes to the ground, the thing's technical, the crowd goes more quiet. Mm. And it understands, they mm. understand what's going on. I love that. I love an educated crowd. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so you and your first MMA fight. So um, uh, we had like an MMA team before I started at Andy's. Every Saturday morning, these guys would like, be sparring. And I'd... Obviously, MMA was the reason I got into jiu-jitsu. Yeah. So I'd watch them spar. And uh, we were going to... A few of the guys were fighting on a show called Into the Cage in a ledge centre in Andover. Really small show. Max 200 people in the room. Just a cage in the front, in a, in a sports hall. I like the name of it. It just sounds so inviting. Yeah, yeah. Into the cage. <laughs> off you go. Get your head ripped off. <laughs> and because um, I could wrap hands because of when I used to box and stuff... Uh, and invited said, "Oh, would you come along and help corner the guys?" And I was like, yeah, "Oh, yeah, right, right, to be a corner." Yeah, so I um, 
I wrapped the, the guys' hands, they went out on that, on that night, everybody won. And then um, I thought to myself, do you know what? You know, I don't know if I can pass judgment on MMA fighters until I've done it myself. Yeah. So I spoke to the promoters, there's any chance of getting me a fight I've never fought before. And he goes, yeah, yeah, no worries, man. I mean, we've been an amateur show, we've got, you know, um, we'll be able to get you a fight, someone on your level. So uh, I thought nothing of it. So a month's gone by, nothing. And I get yeah. a message saying, oh, yeah, I've got you an opponent for the next show. Which he is can't fly either. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. Uh, no, 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 it's this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so you shit out of luck for fighting him, Listen, yeah? we found this guy. He can't get his ass on a plane. I think you guys same level. Oh, shit. And um, I said, yeah, cool. So now my butthole's tightened up. Now. Like, hey, oh, I'm com- just oh. like on that plane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, mate, yeah. Um, and then I thought, okay, now shit's real. So I started training for it, and I really enjoyed the training. And then, um, you know, I didn't know what I was doing at the time. And uh, I remember going to the weigh-in, so I went to the weigh-in. So I really wanted like, a picture of the stare down. And, of you course, because yeah. that's the most important one, yeah. Yeah, and then um, <laughs> I get there, and I'm looking around and thinking, I definitely don't see my guy. I don't see who I'm fighting. So I weigh in, and I was fighting 66 kilos at the time. I walk around about 70, 71 kilos. And uh, it was just my wife that was with me. I'm looking around thinking, I don't recognise anyone here. Where's this guy? And the opponent goes, uh, Jay Butler, I weigh in. Do you want to sit Is my opponent here? He goes, ah, change of plan. I thought, oh, what? He's pulled out. I'm not fighting. He goes, I oh, know you're fighting. Uh, if you want to, obviously. He said, uh, he's got injured, so we're going to replace you with a guy called Josh Skinner. And at this time, it, uh, you couldn't fight amateur. It was semi-pro, so it was three four-minute rounds. Uh, amateur now is three three-minute rounds. Mm-hmm. I thought, okay. He goes, oh, yeah, he's, he's three and oh, semi-pro. I was like, you do know I've never fought before. And he goes, yeah, yeah, take it or leave it. It is what it is. And I've gone... Yeah, fuck it. You know what I mean? <gasps> At that point, I've gone, you know no, what? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll give it. Fuck it. I want to fight. So uh, I didn't really think anything of it. Went home. But don't you think it's better, actually, that some you fight someone with more experience? Maybe that someone is not going to fucking like, do something really crazy. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know? But uh, get a diff- with MMA, you're fighting someone with more experience. Experience counts for everything, man. Mm, oh, mate. Yeah, that's it. not... But um, I thought to myself, that's cool. It's just to you know, get in there and have one and just see what it's like. So we turn up the next day, you know... The adrenaline's pumping. One guy, one of our guys goes out, he wins, he comes back. Another guy goes out, he wins, uh, comes back. I'm like, fuck, I'm second to last out of our guys. I don't want to be that one guy that lets the oh, team down. The pressure is immense, right? So, the, you know, the, guy, the runner comes up and says, Joe Butler, five-minute warning. So you're, you're in the hallway, you're shaking, you're getting ready to go out. You know, I'm standing in the walkway, my music hits the speakers, and it's the best feeling in the world. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, this is what I mean. My missus, my missus got the most distinctive scream in the world. I can hear that. Oh, anywhere. shit. What was your music? Um, what was the song? I, it was, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the tune now. I'll have to play it for you. It's a real hardcore drum and bass. Oh, okay. Real, real drum and bass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, real hardcore. <laughs> you know, so I bowl out and I, I get, get in the cage, and then he walks out after and he's pacing. I thought, cool. So we go out. Slap hands, and I, you know, I had no striking at this time. Yeah, my boxing had way gone, so he threw yeah. a couple of punches, hit me in the chin. I was like, "Ow!" So I double leg him through the floor, and I get on top of him, and uh, we have a little scuffle on the ground. He gets up, I pin him against the cage, I tear his legs out from underneath him, and I mount him. And I think, whenever I watch their mate fights, well, I get the mount. I've won! I've won! So I start smashing this guy's head into the floor, right? And I've got videos of this, and I'm pummeling him. And at one point, I got is it on YouTube? Uh, that one's not. No, I've got it on DVD. So at that point, I've got my hand around his throat and I'm smashing his head so hard. I'm, thinking, I'm looking at the ref going, are you going to stop this? Are you going to stop this? And the kid would not quit. And this fight ends up going three rounds of me mounting him and smashing his head into the floor. I, don't mean, I think he hit me four times in the entire fight. And I ended up winning a unanimous decision. And I was buzzing. It was one of the best experiences in my life to know as soon as that final bell won that I've won. You know, even though I didn't stop him, knew that I've won. Oh, it was amazing. Amazing feeling. Yeah. So you, what you and um, he would never quit. Basically, he would never tap. No, no, he, he would give me his tap. back. He was just never stopped moving. He was yeah, just a yeah, really yeah. experienced guy and yeah, wouldn't yeah. quit. But I just positionally my jiu-jitsu was just so strong. Mm. I just positionally dominated him for three rounds. And what do you think? What was his background? He was he was a grappler as well. He won two of his fights by submission and one by TKO at that point. Mm. But I don't know. I just maybe I just wanted it more. He underestimated me. But I just felt I felt in control the entire fight. Yeah. Right, nice. It's, it's a great experience. And then. And then, know, then the next fight, uh, how much longer you would wait? So that was in March. And then um, I thought, you know what, that would do. You know what I mean? And then um, uh, I just wanted the experience to say I fought MMA. And then the promoter messaged me saying, again, yeah, we're doing another show in November. Would you be interested? And I was like, eh, you know, I want to finish. I want to finish a guy in a fight. So I'll do that. And then same show, Into the Cage. 
And at that point, um, Shock and Awe is another show in Portsmouth becoming really, really mm-hmm. big. Uh, Brian Adams runs that. And uh, I said to him, you know, I would, I'd love to get on your show. And he was at that point, that was sort of like, again, one of the biggest shows in the country. Everyone wanted to get on Shock and Awe. And he's like, you know, I'll, I'll watch your fight and see how you get on. And then, you know, we'll chat or whatever. And so I went out and I uh, ended up fighting a guy called Matt Knight. And uh, I took him down and rear naked choked him in the first minute. Like, dominated him. Absolutely destroyed him. And then... Um, about a couple of weeks later after that fight, uh, I messaged Brian and he said, yeah, you know, we'll have you on the show, shock and awe, uh, that'd be absolutely fine. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop to 135 for this one. So mm-hmm. I eventually wanted to have a professional fight and uh, I'm too small for 66. Some of the 66 guys are probably about the size of you. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So, yeah, um, yeah. Oh, that's great, and that's crazy. Going back to the th- um, doing the weight, the uh, weight, uh, what's it called? Weight cut. Weight cut. It's yeah. just insane. Yes. And, uh, and again, in the book you suggested me, I was reading like the things where they talk about weight cut. It's insane. Weight, weight cut is a is the, is a fight on its own. It's hell on earth. Yeah. It's just yeah. it's, I can't I can't believe it that because like my weight is about uh, now I weigh eighty. Mm. Uh, when I used to do karate, it was 75, so but I didn't do any cuts or anything. I was just yeah. like 75. So you would fight at under 70. Yeah. You'd be a lightweight. That's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. So um, I, I didn't sort of do like a proper weight cut for that. I sort of just dieted. I literally starved myself for a couple of months. Mm. I, I looked awful. Shredded, but awful. So I, wor- I wor- <laughs> like the smirk. Yeah. Shredded, <laughs> but awful. Well, you know, there's some benefits yeah. to it, yeah. Was it like a Brad Pitt and a snatch? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes, like that was it. The Just, gypsy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so um, I, I weighed in at 61 kilos, and by the time I fought, I was only about 63 kilos. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I fought a guy, um, Stephen Cameron, on Shock and Awe. And it was in the height of summer, and this was uh, in 2013, and we had that immense summer. And you're underneath these lights. So much so they had to open all the doors out in the arena, giving people fans. And mm. So um, I go three rounds with this guy, and he, again, he, he, he's super tough. And I was beating the hell out of him. Uh, and I uh, ended up catching him with a rear naked choke in the third round and, and winning my shock and all debut. To do afterwards, I pretty much collapsed backstage. I was so tired. That was such a tough fight. Yeah, and then um, I was 29 at the time, and I thought, you know what? I want to have one pro fight before, 30? before I stop. Yeah. Or before you stop? Yeah, just before I stop, you know, because I'm getting too old. In my eyes, I was at the time. So I said to Brian, you know, um, I would like to fight again. He said, yeah, no worries, man. I said, I want to go pro. And he goes, no worries, I've got something for you. And my pro debut was against a guy called Anton De Freitas, and Anton's a really lovely guy. He's a really good fighter as well, mm. nice chap. And it was almost like it was written in the stars. That is was there any of these videos online we can actually um, have a look? The only fight uh, that would be online is Hayden Sheriff, and that was later on. The rest with Shock and All, what they used to do in the day was sell the DVDs. Mm. Obviously, make more money for the yeah, shows. Yeah. They would never put any fights on YouTube. Oh, it was gotcha. just more and more yeah. uh, for the DVD sort of sales. But um, when, when I had to fight Anton, like I said, it was almost like we were supposed to fight together. Uh, every time I would walk out on previous shows, he would either walk past me walking out to a fight or walk back from a fight we'd always mm. bump shoulders always see each other uh, so it's almost like it was written in the stars that it was supposed to fight so I, I made my pro debut in March 2014 and again it was four of us on that show four of us so uh, my friend Clev went out fought my mate Matt Newman went out fought and won and then it was me mm. okay uh, I went out and I think a minute and 40 seconds, I took his back and choked him on my pro mm. debut. And then my good friend Tim Mendes went out on the co-main event uh, and won by really naked, uh, head and arm triangle. So it's like the best night of MMA I ever had. You wow. Know, all, all four of us went out, all done our job. And it was just, yeah, it was an incredible feeling to win my professional debut. It was a good feeling. So how many fights did you have as a professional then? So I had four. Four. Uh, Is this one of them? This is uh, Hayden Sheriff. Yeah, this was, this was, this was... Um, this was a professional bout. This was a, a, a funny one because Hayden's a bit of a traveling um, sort of guy, sort of fights anyone, sort of jumps in at late notice. Yeah. And uh, I was supposed to fight Scott Pauley, who was the former shock and awe bantamweight champion and uh, featherweight champion. So he was a really good test for me. And I would have got a title shot afterwards. And uh, he pulled out. Um, I would have watched this one. Like you smashed his legs, 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 legs. Yeah. Uh, and then he just went for it. He looks like he's like 15 years old. Yeah, he does. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's a boxer. Oh, yeah. So he's, yeah. he's a boxer, as you tell by his shorts and stuff. So he just froze down. And uh, he was brought in at late notice. So I had to fight him. I didn't want to fight him, but it kept me. I, I'd done all that training. Yeah, he felt very awkward that you were kicking him in the legs. Yeah. He was like, why are you kicking me in the legs? Yeah, this one's a quick one. Yeah. Um, but I just wanted to, you know, get more cage time. And um, 
you know, fight. Oh, and this was such a mistake for the guy when he gave you his. his when, when I mounted him, man, the noises his neck made, like oh here, there's so God. much pressure behind that. Yeah, especially when you did this arching with your back. You used such a <laughs> conniving. <laughs> Look at this. The pressure. Like when you're going to do, and you're holding, it's fine, but now you're going to start arching. Oh. And yeah, push those legs yeah, back. Yeah, that was a panic attack. Like, Get me out of here! Oh my you know, god, poor, um, poor boy. And then I went, uh, I went from there to uh, to Bama, which is the, was the biggest show in Europe. It's now been bought out by Bellator. Mm. And um, and then I fought on there. Unfortunately, I didn't win my debut on there. I fought a very tough guy called Cam Els, who's a really cool guy. Uh, he's fought on Bellator and he's in the UFC now. You know mm. what I mean? So, and then I had a few more. Uh, I signed for Bellator uh, for Bama after that. And uh, had a two-fight deal. I was supposed to fight Chris Mir, another great fighter. He pulled out two days before the fight with a back injury, so that fight didn't happen. And then I was uh, booked to fight Blaine O'Driscoll, who also made it to Bellator. And he's a great guy, Blaine. Really good, good fighter. And I, I broke my hand, like my thumb, about three, oh, no. three weeks before. And uh, it's, you know, it's got to that point where I was just like, Do you know what? I think it's time to knock MMA on the head. Yeah. And then I what year like, was that? That was um, 2017. 17. And I thought, you know, and I had to stop, stop training MMA and I started uh, doing more jiu-jitsu, you know, in practice. I thought, you know what, I'd start competing a lot more jiu-jitsu. So yeah, I started yeah. getting into the sub-only scene. On, uh, I fought on Tough, uh, Tough Challenge, which was really, really Is there any, fight. so before we go, there's a quite a lot of videos of you mm. doing grappling, mm. uh, no gi. Um, I think, do you have any videos with gi as well? Uh, yeah, there's a Tough, Tough 4. Okay. Uh, I think it's Before like we go Danny there, um, anything else from MMA fights? Do you have yeah, anything? Not on YouTube. No, it was not on YouTube, all, just all this DVD one. and stuff, you know. What about this one, Battle of Grapple 3? That's, um, <laughs> that, that was a great fight. That was against the MMA legend that is Brad Pickett. Okay. That, that was a huge fight. This was, this was a, a really good grappling event that I really wanted to bring back, actually. This is a real cool show to fight on. And, um, yeah, fighting Brad was uh, an absolute privilege. You know I mean, MMA royalty, this mm. guy, you know, UFC he was the pioneer for UK Jiu Jitsu, you know, and his wrestling is is incredible. Isn't he heavier than you? No, he, he this, oh. was, this was at under seventy. You know, mm. he fought a bantam weight like I did in MMA, you know. Um, but this was this was one hell of a fight. I really enjoyed this. I got a lot of criticism for this fight. A lot really? Of criticism. Yeah, you know, because obviously Brad is uh, his wrestling is is incredible. Obviously, I'm a Jiu Jitsu guy. Sit down, attack the legs. Yeah, yeah, stuff, yeah, so. yeah. But I wanted to wrestle with Brad. I want to see if I could hang hang with such yeah. a world class wrestler. And did you, know you know see? I, mean? I did find out. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, if you if you keep watching this video, you're going to find out yourself in a probably about in about 20 seconds. You know, the fight ended up being a draw, but I think I positionally, you know, if this was a, a points uh, a fight, it would have gone my way. You know, taking nothing away from Brad, the guy's a legend. Uh, regarding wrestling, so how much would you say like percentage wise or like the combination wise is great to have so uh, to be a good bjj let's say let's just focus on no gi um how good is to have a a strong background of wrestler um does any judo stuff helps judo probably Ju judo does help for, you know for hip throws and stuff like encounters when people shoot on you in wrestling i use right. a lot of it in this fight here as well actually um but wrestling wrestling for any form of grappling art is incredible. I think wrestling is probably the hardest thing I've ever done. Mm. You know, what I mean, the intensity, the training with jujitsu. You know, you can take someone down, get side control, mount, rest a little bit. With wrestling, there's no resting. You so, do you chance. suggest uh, your your students, uh, let's say, if they want to improve their game, to go do some wrestling as oh, well? 100 yeah. percent. You know, you've got you've got two stand up paths: judo and wrestling. Mm. For me, it was always wrestling. My wrestling coach, Barna. Uh, he was incredible. There's a funny story on how I met him as well. That's just that's that's killer. That is. Um, but Barno is a Hungarian guy, and his brother does the wrestling. And he's now Chaba. Uh, Barno's wrestling was just incredible, mm -hmm. just incredible. Like I said, when I was working in the leisure centre, we used to have parties on a Saturday night for kids, pool parties, and uh, a lot of the mums would order from Domino's. And I remember being in reception one night, and this guy walks in about three or four Domino boxes. Barno looks like a uh, best way to describe uh, Barno. He looks like the Pillsbury Doughboy. <laughs> but with but with big round glasses, right? He looks so innocent, bless him. He's really short, kind of chubby guy. Pillsbury Doughboy. Yeah, people people in the UK know exactly who okay. you mean. Uh, <laughs> or in America, pop and fresh. Okay, okay. People don't know who I'm talking about. And uh, he bowls in, and he's, he's waiting for the, the mum to come down. And he sees my cauliflower, and he goes, "Oh, oh do you wrestle?" I said, uh, "No, man, I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu." He goes, "Oh, good. I, I wrestle." I goes, "Okay, yeah, right." And he goes, "He goes, uh, where do you train?" I said, "Oh, I train in Cove with Andy." He goes, "Oh, I live in Fleet. Do you want to wrestle?" I was like, well, right now? And he said, no. He goes, I'll, I'll come and show you to wrestle. And he goes, 7 o'clock tomorrow morning, we wrestle. And I was yeah. like, 
All right, so I wrote down the address and I thought, this guy ain't going to show up. So I turn up at Andy's in the morning, get the heaters on, it's freezing. And uh, he pulls up in his car and comes in in his baggy tracksuit, wrestling boots over his shoulder. I was like, oh, what's going on here then? He goes, he goes, we wrestle yet? And I goes, yeah, okay. And he, he puts his wrestling boots on. He uh, limbers up his shoulder and goes, okay, I'll warm up. He goes, all right. He starts backflipping across the freaking academy. Full, a bit like yourself, full splits, everything. Warms his neck up and he goes, okay, we wrestle now. And I was like, oh, no, we shit. fucking don't wrestle now. Did okay. He say, okay, we wrestle now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm okay, thank you. But man, like, I used to meet him. We used to do like, exchange techniques, you know, so I would teach him jiu-jitsu, he'd teach me wrestling, and, you know, pretty much every day I could, I'd spend time with Barna, and I'd become really good friends with him, and I'd become obsessed with the mm. wrestling. And again, as a person and as a coach, he, he's phenomenal, man. What phenomenal. do you use for your uh, uh, game from uh, wrestling? What is the easiest way you can t tell what you use from... So, so you mean what my favorite technique? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Press play. Hey, perfect. Say, so, yeah... Uh, a couple of seconds you're going to see and this is what I teach um, all my guys this is uh, a takedown that I'm that I'm known for and oh I, yeah I think I think um, yeah and you were teaching us uh, yeah, that yeah. as well so, so this is um, a, the, the a, a leg prime, inside a, pr a prime example of that is uh, we're going to spin off in a second here it's funny nah. it looks like he's wearing mm. his underwear it's, <laughs> not even like, it's, just, <laughs> it's just like So now, wow! That's that. That, that, that is your signature yeah, move. Yeah. I I've, love I've, it. I've hit it's that in competition so many times. Um, such a good move. That is one of my favorites. Inside trip. So as I circle I like around now, that Jay is not shy that. from standing with right, risk and with risk picket. control on that right arm. Now, yeah, and you wow. get and, and, you, and you get that yeah his right arm and because yeah. you know when you you hit the pressure on the right hip there he's gonna want to step back with that right leg yeah and if he can't. You're gonna hit the floor. Like take 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 down. Down. <laughs> Excellent leg My only take problem down. in this fight is I didn't follow it up. I should have tried and stand on top, you know. Mm. But I'd, I was in a wrestling mood. I thought if I take them down once, yeah. I can try. Yeah. And then Brad just hits a beautiful double leg on me and puts me through the floor. And that was pretty much what it was like. This fight, just a wrestling exchange back and forth. He would take me down, I would take him down, and then um, I jump guard at one point. I get a good sweep to mount. You know, mm. but yeah, it was, it was a good fun fight, and it was a privilege to fight someone at Brad Pitt. I used to watch yeah. him on TV when I was watching MMA. You know what I mean? And then I never thought one day I'd be standing in front of him. Yeah, you, you know? should be whispering him in the ear, like you get you get me uh, the autograph later. Okay? Yeah, I'll get the autograph later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, one of my one of my favorite pictures ever taken of me competing is with Brad. It's just me and him embracing after the fight, and it's just it just tells you, you know, picture says a thousand words. Mm. That was it. You know, uh, just nothing but respect for him. He's absolutely brilliant. Okay, where's the action? How far are we getting before the submission? Oh, I didn't sub him. It ended up being a draw. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. none of you subbed. Uh, no, nah, it, was, it was like I said, it's a big wrestling exchange, yeah. just back and forth and stuff. It was just a good, fun, high paced sort of fight with me and him. Okay, really this is our it. second segment, another 30 minutes, and we're going to be back in a second. <laughs> so we were just discussing how nice and warm that blanket is. <laughs> <laughs> I may take this with me, man. This is some good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually, it's, it's really good. Like when I was doing my um, uh, traveling with my camper van. So, you, you know, it could be really cold, but if you have this one and if you buy another one, like in two, you're perfect. <laughs> it's all sorted. Um, let's talk about some of the uh, exciting things were are um, about to happen. Mm. About to happen? The fights? Fights, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, yeah. Tell me what are the uh, what are the fights we're talking about? Uh, my, my favorite fight or my biggest fight? me apart from fighting uh, two of Danaher's boys uh, UK base is uh, me versus Marco Canna yeah that was is this upcoming or is it happening this one I've had you yeah. know what I mean this is this was real sort of career defining proving to myself that I am right and is this know. something you want to on YouTube yeah yeah, yeah 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 if you type in Jay Butler BJJ yeah yeah um, it should be along there Okay, while well I'm looking for it, this, start telling me this about was, it. This was a big one um, for me. Yeah, the second one down. Uh, Marco is... I remember seeing Marco fight my coach when I was um, a blue belt. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Marco's a black belt. And uh, Marco, I look, sort of looked up to him. He, he's an incredible person, amazing coach, and he's an incredible grappler. You know, all the UK guys know about Marco Cannon. Mm -hmm. He's a great, great guy. Uh, an extremely good fighter. And, and uh, he beat my coach on... Um, uh, the Bournemouth Open in a super fight and then uh, many many years later I'm a brown belt and uh, my coach fights him again on a submission only show called Tough 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I go out and I win my fight by leg lock. And then uh, my coach, uh, the, you know, fights Marco and gets caught with an armbar in the first minute. You know, Aunt Marco's looking phenomenal. Well, wow. yeah, I fight on Polaris, which is the biggest grappling show in Europe. You know, some say it's getting up there in the world. And um, uh, I lose that night to Sean McDonough, who's another world-class black belt. And Marco fights uh, a friend of mine, Ashley Grimshaw, mm-hmm. and beats Ashley. His, his passing game's phenomenal. And then I'm on holiday, and I get a message from a, an MMA pro saying, oh, I'm going to put uh, grappling matches on in between fights. Um, Marco Canna showed an interest in fighting you. Would you be interested? And I was like, I didn't hesitate. Of course. Yes, it's Marco Canna. I'd love to. You know, I mean, it'd be a privilege for me. And, um, you know, I didn't hold out much hope at the time. I didn't have much confidence. I don't know why, you know. And uh, I thought to myself, if I can beat someone like Marco Canna, it proves that, and I say this in my post when I really believe I'm one of the you know, top guys in the country. Yeah. You know? And, um, uh, you know, standing across the cage uh, from Marco was, was terrifying for me. Someone I looked up to, someone I've watched for years. Yeah, yeah, you know, I can imagine. Black belt 90% of my entire career and now I've got to slap hands and, and fight him. And, uh, you know, you have that fear. As soon as you slap hands, I got hold of him and he got hold of me. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm this level. I deserve to be here. Where is base, Marco Kenner? Uh, fight Zone in London. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Again, he's been a, he's been around for, I think he's a third degree black belt now. He's, and he coaching, he He coaches, coaches yeah, yeah. He's got a great, t- he's got one of the biggest teams in the country. You know, oh, okay. He's part of the team check mat. And, he, you know, like I said, he's just a lovely lovely person Marco so nice such a nice guy mm. got nothing but good things to say about him and all the respect in BJJ the world BJJ guys are usually nice people you get the odd few really oh man you can get you actually say that like oh there are a couple of assholes I know oh, 100%, 100% really yeah I'm not going to say Hugh uh, um, you know in this country uh, who that is but there are a few people that their arrogance mm. just gets way too much for them be humble in victory and defeat you know I mean you got some people that win and mm. completely destroy their opponent online and stuff like that. It's sort of like, dude, your time will come. You will come mm. unstuck. I met one blue belt in Bali. Yeah. Total asshole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man, they're about... They're, dude, that won't be the first and that won't be the last, my friend. You're, there's, they're out there. There's loads of them. You know what I mean? Because so I, I was like, I just thought all of us would come in here to have fun. What, what do you need to prove? What? Yeah. It's like... Oh, yeah. anyways, sorry. That's cool. Back to Marco Cannon. Yeah, so uh, so we, we, started, we started the fight. And um, again, I... Um, with my uh, takedown, Marco obviously sort of knows I like that takedown. Mm. So uh, if we f- we flick forward, we have like a, a bit of a wrestling exchange for a bit. Okay, so I was feeling each other out, feeling the aggression. We keep flicking, keep <laughs> flicking. I tell you when it is. For those who are l- uh, listening, this feeling each other out <laughs> it's, it's doesn't not, mean what you think it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're having a wrestling. And see here, he keeps grabbing my right arm. Yeah. He was looking for my inside trip. Yeah. Okay. So um, is he again, stealing your um, your take? I, I think he just wanted to do it to me, just to prove that he's 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 bare at me, you know. Uh, yeah. At that point, <gasps> again, is tough. that is that ego? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just I don't know. Just um, at the end of the day, I'm sort of an understudy to him. You know, he's he's been around a long time. I'm yeah. sort of a a newer guy on the scene. So we, again, we're, we're exchanging. If we flick forward a bit more, it's just it, the the beginning of the fight's um, a little bit boring. It's the end. So he's trying to shoot. I'm trying to stop him from wrestling. And that, and uh, I've got one of my uh, purple belts at the time in the crowd. Cam, Cam Berriton, big shout out to him. Man, mm. the kid's going to be huge one day. And uh, again, I never have a black belt corner me. I have my closest friends like Cam. And uh, in the in the actual video that I've got on my phone, which is recorded, you can hear him say he's going to hit an inside trip. Jay, he's going to hit the inside trip, which is uh, coming in a minute. Both of them. Um, and um, if I was if I was if I was in there. I take advantage because they d- normally fight under those, those you got, You've got to love a commentator, yeah, if I was in there. In the well, why don't you get in there then? <laughs> so, so, would you uh, like to commentate one day? Uh, on a grappling match, I would, yeah, definitely. You know, but um, you've got to love a commentator, you know. Is he not wearing t- uh, the guard, mouth guard? Marco. Possibly. Here, here, this is when he goes for the oh, no trip. And you got it. Arm drag, Jay's gone straight for his... his so in the leg. saddle, Marco, he tries to roll out a catch and lock. So Rolled I'm trying to control his secondary leg. leg. So I knew it. which way he was going to escape, Outside so I let it go. He's not got it. No, not yet, but he has now. Oh. oh. And then I'm catching the inside heel hook. For that, I mean, I'm very passionate about this sport, okay? And I, you know, I wear my heart on my sleeve. People see my emotions. And the way I celebrate here just goes to show the dedication I, I put in. So I jump on top of the cage and I scream as hard as I can. 
Oh, was, oh they're uh, not was, showing it. I know. I, I, I was so blown away by we it. Just, we just see you, you get this, and then you're like, oh, we shit. <laughs> I, was, I, was in, I was in some ways in disbelief oh my god i've just submitted mark ogana you know what i mean and, and that was huge for me that was huge and it when still this, is when was this uh, it's just a couple of years ago now um but that the, the praise and the message i got from that from other grapplers saying man that that's a big name big name nice nice that was, that was what, what did now. what did marco said after after the uh, watch yeah i got a lot of messages from his students Nothing. Did they want to? No. Did they want to be your students? Then? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing but respect. Look, you know, I, I love him. I tell him now. This is, I tell him now. Don't let him go for ages. They want to show this, but telling him how much of an idol of mine he was. Mm. You know, what I mean, and how it was a privilege to to fight him and stuff like that. You know, because it really was for me. You know, he, he's he's brilliant. I've got a lot of, lot of time for mm. that guy, and that was that was big career changing. That's awesome. Mm. But, and there was another fight you said as well. Uh, uh, I've got so many. I, I mean, I've been fortunate enough to fight over the last couple of years, pretty much the best of the best. Mm. You know, some names like Frank Rosenfall, member of the Danaher Def Squad, Robert Deagle, Camille Wilk. Me and Camille have become really good friends since we fought world class. Mm. Ash Ashley Williams. Ashley Williams, for me, and I always say this about him, he is the best featherweight in the world. He doesn't mm. get the, the praise he deserves. Um, but he's, you know, three times Polaris world champion in three different weight classes. Wow. He's just qualified for the ADCC. He literally, that kid wins everything. And I fought Ash twice. He's beaten me twice, once in the gi uh, and once no gi, you know. And um, and we've become good friends since then. I've trained with him in Wales. He's done a charity seminar for my boy. Again, nothing but respect for him. He's uh, phenomenal. And then I had the privilege of fighting his twin brother, mm. uh, Josh. In that case, the fight went my way. This is a really good fight. This is a um, sort of real good leg exchange. Uh, and I catch uh, Josh with a um, a really, really deep toe hold to the point where he didn't really have time to tap. He, scre have that he video screams. Here? Yeah, if you go below the Marco Canna one. This one? Yeah, this one here. This is, a, again, another submission only show. And uh, Josh is, a, again, another great guy. Ash's twin brother. And Ash, like I said, has uh, beaten me. Uh, before so we start this fight and Josh sort of plays off his back a lot mm -hmm. he's, got, he's got a really really flexible guy really really good guard and I, I hit uh, if you're watching this first couple of seconds I hit um, hit a leg uh, and I, I, I put this on fairly hard he goes to pummel inside I catch his outside leg here and I sit okay so I get a good bite and he sits off so again I try the heel can't catch it I switch to a toe hold so I put this on Okay, and I feel this. I feel things twisting. You see by the expression on his face, it's painful. So I let go, thinking, "Are you okay?" But he carries on fighting. I think, "All right, okay, that won't that won't tight enough." Oh, so, so, so I use, what? Wait, you thought you submitted him, but he didn't. Well, tap it's, out, made, it's made a horrendous noise. So oh. I thought he's going to stop. But Josh, he's world class. He's tough as nails. Tough yeah. as nails. Yeah, I, my foot made noise one one time as well, but I, I was a little bit hurt. I was uh, like a week or two weeks. I could feel it. Yeah, that was with um, Math Matthew. Uh, the brown belt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> he literally, he cracked it. He looks at me like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we continue this exchange. And then uh, if you flick forward towards the end, it's not a very long fight. Uh, sort of legs. I'm looking for leg attacks. Yeah, keep going, keep going, keep going. Uh, go some, back, go back. Moment to stop. Just there, around here. Um, so my coach, Gareth, again, he's an, another legend. Uh, one of my guys, he's... um. Uh, he's a brown belt, should be a black belt now. Uh, he says to, he says, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to go for the same leg, uh, trying to catch, and we end up in the same exchange and end up with the same same toe hold. Mm. Uh, and Gareth says this time, don't let go, just don't let go. So for the next sort of thirty seconds, we hit that exchange again, uh, and I don't let go. You can flick it a little bit forward here, and it's uh, just here. This one it starts towards towards the end. My Gareth just there in the puma top on the side. So I hit the leg. He he pummels out really well. I catch the leg. I look for the heel hook. Ooh, he's flexible. Oh my he god! Switches. How that foot just bent. Uh, uh, Josh has got the most flexible ankles look in the that. world. Ridiculous! No, 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 this is. It felt like what the hell? Like. So I get Look, a fairly decent bite. That's that's the one. How do you not tap there? 
<laughs> he's just too tough, man. That he, is uh, ridiculous. Look at this. So I'm putting a lot of power into that. I catch. Then that's the finish. You you go back up, go back a little bit. Oh, he's saying that he didn't tap. No, no, he no, he he tapped. Keep going, keep going, keep going back. Just to here. So watch this. Just play it from here. This is where we have this leg exchange. Uh, just keeps clicking to this. Just yeah, it goes just straight away. Here from this. Yeah. Yeah. They, they took yeah. It I'm not sure, but the exchange happens there, and his foot nearly does a 360 in my hands, and he has to scream to top to stop me. Um, but obviously, I'm very apologetic, very respectful. I was like, "You okay, God? You know, you don't set out to hurt so anyone." So why didn't he tap then before? I mean, I'm not sure. Oh, he's, you know, he's in front of his family and friends, his brothers in his corner. He's a tough guy. You know, fair play to him, much respect. You know, I mean, he's tough as nails. This is the interesting thing about when is it tough and when is it just stupid? <laughs> it's a fine line, a very, you know very, what I mean? Fine line. It's like yeah. just a tiny bit more, and he could be out for a month. Yeah, but that's the thing is, you know, when you're when you're a high class competitor like him and like people, you put these things on the line. It's what it means to you. You like you don't want to go out. You know, what if he didn't tap then in two minutes later, he caught my back and choked me. Yeah, that's yeah. the way you look at it in some of these fights. That's true. That's you true. You know what I mean? But that, that that was a really really good fight. I think 2019, um, I had a really good run. I uh, double golded in the British. You know, won the British gi, won the British no gi. I had multiple sub-only fights, you know, against world-class opponents, won a load, uh, lost a few. You know, that was probably my best year of competing jiu-jitsu. So with the gi and no gi, um, what is the ratio for competitions for you? Um, uh, it's more no gi now. More no but gi. When I first started out, it was predominantly gi, because that's all I did. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, again, I was saying to you earlier on, people, people can relate to no gi more. It looks like MMA. People see yeah. it, you know what I mean? And yeah. it attracts more people than gi. I would say also it just looks more practical because like how often you're going to have someone wearing the full how people call it pajamas <laughs> <laughs> um exactly that you know so um if someone said to me now oh jay do you want to have a roll for a bit uh, i would suggest no no gi yeah me. no don't get me wrong i don't diss the gi i'm not against the gi i still train in my gi but um at this moment in time i just enjoy no gi more why do they call it gi isn't it kimono kimono yeah kimono it's just short for it is yeah. it yeah japanese funeral wear because oh, yeah, when I used to do karate, it was always kimono. We never called it a gi. Yeah. And when it came like gi, Brazilians are more relaxed, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Talking about countries, which you would consider are the most dominant in uh, BJJ? And would it be more someone who is gi and no gi? So at this moment in time, it's got to be the Americans. I think, the, you know, the Americans, obviously the Brazilians are always going to be a dominant force. Uh, more and more UK guys like Ash Williams are coming through. People, you know, at the UK are getting more respected. More UK guys like Owen Flanagan, Ross Nichols qualifying for the ADCC. Mm -hmm. So the UK is getting there. You know, the biggest event in the world. The ADCC is the World Cup of our sport. It's mm -hmm. every two years. Only you, every two only years? Only every two years. And you can't just enter it. You have to win what's called the trials, which are the hardest trials in the world to win because everyone wants to do it. You're either a, a current champion or you get invited because mm -hmm. you've just pretty much won everything. So every grappler in the world wants to be on that stage. And more and more UK guys are, are, are coming through and uh, winning the trials and getting on there. But the, the Americans, I think, at the moment, are probably the most dominating force. You know, Because Americans always just go to extreme. Yeah. <laughs> to, to anything. <laughs> let's get some food and get fat. Americans. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, so okay, get, that's the, the worst example. <laughs> but yeah, and it's again, it's a sheer volume and sh it's just like the culture of BJJ in in states is crazy. Yeah, I think uh, again, a lot of the Brazilians move to America yeah. because they could earn more money in America doing yeah, it, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So um, you know, more and more Americans are doing it a bit like, you know, you got Gordon Ryan who's probably the greatest nogi grappler ever mm. to live ever mm. you know and people want to follow in his footsteps and they're training now and, and you know you've got the Danaher former Danaher death squad coming out of New York and then Puerto Rico and stuff and they're just winning everything you know what I mean so what do you think about the whole Gracie family and uh, how they how they just kind of started their journey it's interesting because like I was um, I was listening one of the audiobooks uh, breathe or mm -hmm. breath breathe I think and uh, I, I, they told, uh, so the, the, the more the story, how they basically, one of the ideas was just, just to create as many offsprings as possible. <laughs> and they're literally <laughs> like, uh, well, not with my wife, I will do with other women. And yeah. it's just, we're going to have a lot of kids who do BJJ. And it was kind of like, this is like a cult. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could so, call it a cult, yeah. yeah. It's like, wow, BJJ cult. There's, mm. a, there's definitely a lot of graces in the world. Yeah. yeah. So, so let's, just, let's just leave it at this. They're a big family. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's quite yeah. quite interesting. Yeah. Um, also, I, I asked you about uh, telling me about your favorite books and uh, favorite films. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I, I wrote it down on a piece of paper. I read one of the books. It was uh, oh god, my got, head got fight, by got fight, yeah. yeah, and. Um, uh, one of the craziest books I ever read yeah. because it feels like you, you're talking to someone and uh, yes. like to your pal and yeah. he's telling you and and it's I think it's great book for people just to get some advices uh, even if you don't get into fighting it's just like a, just a it's yeah. quite funny the, book yeah as well. the way the fact that you've got to take a man test before you're allowed to read yeah. the book is brilliant yeah and just how. Uh, Forrest puts things across and if you watch his journey in the UFC from the ultimate fire to the, you know becoming the light heavyweight champion mm. of the world and coming from nothing and stuff like that and then you read his book how simple Forrest is with things yeah yeah, yeah well I was watching you know, a couple of videos when they did the first uh, what they when they saying like a reality show inside. yeah the ultimate fire yeah yeah. I watched that a little bit and then the shit what he was doing uh, oh he was uh, pretending that he's a, a, a monkey yeah, gorilla yeah, yeah, and just yeah, eating yeah, bananas and yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Was yeah. Like, yep. he, he, he's off his head and I was like how did he wrote that book? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure someone helped him. Um, oh, I'd say so, definitely. Yeah. But, you know, it's just the stories in that uh, are brilliant. You can, and some of the stuff when you fought MMA and you've done Jiu-Jitsu training, you can relate to. It's like, yeah, I know that sort of person, that sort of person. Yeah, and some yeah. of them also, it's it's uh, very practical, like talking about uh, staff infections, talking about yep. just like how to maintain your hygiene, what to do, what not to do. I really could relate when he was talking about that when someone has a stinky gi and then sits <laughs> the on your inso- sits on your ha- on your face with the sweaty bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not kidding you. We had one guy in Pride Gym here who did the say he he just did the uh, Muay Thai before that and all sweaty and stinky and sits on my head. I was like, this is not happening. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is not happening. Because in Bali, uh, in Bali MMA, actually, coach could just ask you to leave. Yeah, and that is that is just I think that is that's how it should be. Yeah, I was in a lot of gyms. Um, I think where you become so sort of close. Uh, you know, close in the community with Jiu Jitsu, so you let things slide in some schools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, David Anuma's gym, his white geese only, mm-hmm. always in a fresh gi. Mm. If you're late by five minutes to a session, sorry, you have to go home, you're not joining the session. Mm. It's all about old school, oh, that's what I love about it. It's all about mm. old school respect. This it's not laid back, it is you follow the rules, you become an amazing grappler, but it's very you know structured, and I love that. But you've got some other gyms, you know, yeah, 20 minutes late, don't matter, I'll just bowl in, do this, do that. It sort of takes yeah. the, some of the you know. The respect away from what you're doing, they're bowing before you get on the mats and stuff. Totally, like that. I totally agree. Because I also, when I did karate uh, for what seven years, I remember one time I was late and I forgot to take my earring out of my ear. Mm. Coach came home and just rip it out. <laughs> That's that is old school. That was, a, and he was like this proper Russian fucker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's like, I ain't gonna mess with you. Lotkovskis, you late? <laughs> Come here, <laughs> hundred push-ups. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I did enjoy that because uh, because in the same time I used to play basketball and football and other things, and people were like, eh, like you know this attitude, whatever. But like martial arts was like. Tch. Yeah. to do that stuff yeah yes yeah, and that's book. that's what i think also the young people really lack and and joe rogan suggests that that could be a cure for um outrageous uh culture uh what we have now when the, when the kids in college they're just you know this is bad that's bad I'm, yeah you know the world the world's got weak yeah really weak and this is why because i teach the kids classes at uh, and andy's academy and some of these kids uh you know they, they obviously get away with murder and their parents have brought them down to teach them a bit of discipline, you know what I mean? And yeah. uh, the whole, some of them, when we, we do like a King of the Hill stuff, no submissions, but sort of a bit of wrestling, a bit of takedowns and stuff mm-hmm, for the kids mm-hmm. to get a feel for it and stuff. I used to play it actually in reality, King of the Hill. I'll yeah. tell you later, continue, yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, some of them, when they get swept or lose, it's a hissy fit, mm. it's crying. Mm. You know? and you've got to explain to these kids, you're going to lose at things. Mm. Like, like, you know, life's all about losing. You're going to lose at something. I've lost, everyone loses. You've got to learn to accept that. And some of these kids... You know, a lot of them, when they first started out, were like that, and now they full on accept. Yeah, okay. I think in you know my kids have it in school. Everybody wins. No, they don't. You shouldn't be teaching kids that because, you know, it builds that sort of sense of security that everything in life is always going to be okay. You know, my kids, you lost, you lost. That's it. Get on. I with think it. that's Crack one on. of the worst things you can ever do to yes. your kids. Yes. It's like literally, it's a, it's like. Um, it's even I don't even want to compare it with to tell your child that you know you're gonna be the best no matter what you do yeah you know all yeah. of this like and then and then you see on X Factor when the in, in America especially when these kids come in they have no voice whatsoever and then their parents storm in like how dare you say to my child they're not the yeah, best yeah, like yeah, they yeah. are the best yeah and they're like what world are you living in yes yeah you know and it, it you know 
teaching your kids that will, will help them grow stronger in life, you know. Yeah, you're not always going to get the job you go for. Yeah. Oh, but I was told in school I'd always win. Mm. No, no, you don't. No. You know yeah. what I mean? You know. Yeah, that's um, that. That is one of the things what everyone has to learn sooner or later. Yeah, sometimes um, harder than others. Then talking <laughs> about some crazy stuff as well. Uh, the films you suggested me. So the other book you suggested me was the Gracie Way. Yeah, I love that, that book. book. It's not possible to find it no, online. Yeah, yeah, you, you need to you buy that shit. It's like seventy pounds or yeah, something. Yeah, it's like um, you see some of them on eBay selling for like three hundred and fifty quid. It's insane. Yeah, I got mine just, back it, in the day when it was cheap. <laughs> and you decided to? Oh no, this is one of my books. Like, <laughs> how the fuck are I gonna read it? <laughs> and um, even in, even this one with Forrest, I couldn't uh, I couldn't get audio version so i i read like a slug so it took me forever to even get like <laughs> over the half i was i was actually reading every time i was in sauna mm. i do every day 25 minutes sauna yeah, yeah so all i can think of as soon as you talk about that book i just feel sweat sweat <laughs> go through and dying um and the 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 films it was easier for me so your favorite films was um you mentioned it was uh, raging bull which mm -hmm. i never seen before i heard a lot about it i yeah. watched it just anyone who hasn't seen that film watch it it's insane it's a good film and and uh, you know the boxing and all that is it's quite bullshit like for me stunt performers seeing like how they're selling the punches and just <laughs> like oh my god <laughs> you want to close your eyes but that's not what it's about it's about all these crazy struggles what actually uh, de niro character had yeah. when yeah. the guy start losing his mind he's mm -hmm. like getting super jealous for no reason yeah, beats paranoid. up his brother and yep. stuff yeah loses everything loses everything loses everything and then, then when he's sitting fat and just telling these jokes and yeah. it's quite crazy what what did you take from that film uh just just his mindset mm. when he, only his training and what he was fighting for mm. you know what i mean I don't think uh, he was Jake Lamont was always the best technical boxer, but his heart. Mm. You watch him, you know, when he when he fought, there was no no quit in him. Was he never knocked out? Mm. You know, he never yeah, knocked yeah. out. You know, he would. It's just the wars that he had. I loved his toughness. The fact that he was never willing to die, willing yeah. to die. Because one of the last fights, he was totally busted, but yeah. he never dropped. No, and he says to him afterwards, isn't he? You never knocked me, yeah, me, yeah, me down. You never knocked me. You never knocked me down. You never. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, probably, you? probably not the best move. It's like, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> you never knocked me out. <laughs> then the other two films was Braveheart and uh, Gladiator. Mm -hmm. Gladiator is one, one of my favorite films. Yeah. And uh, funny story, I would just tell you that I was I was doing the stunt job uh, in all the homes. Mm -hmm. And one of my stunt uh, uh, like performers, he's actually a stunt coordinator for years now. His name is Tony Luckin. And he's in the gladiator in that fight scene when he, they're topless in the in the forest practicing yeah, with yeah. The, uh, the asshole prince or whatever yeah, yeah, that yeah, guy yeah. was. Yeah. And he's there, so <laughs> it's like it was. F it's crazy for me to meet uh, these legends in the working in the stunt yeah, industry. Yeah, yeah. But talking about the film, um, one of the coolest films there is. Yeah, an ageless film. Yeah, it just you can watch that film over and over and over again. The only thing I thought like Russell Crowe could be in better shape because <laughs> everyone is ripped. Yeah, and yeah, this yeah. guy's just like hiding his one pack under that yeah, armor yeah. stuff and whatever. But, but he's badass in it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah that's, yeah, the, that's that, the that's thing, a, you know. And, and I think of what it shows as well is um is his his mind was the weapon. You yeah, know, when, yeah, yeah, when. When they fight the Battle of Carthage, you know how he organizes everyone yeah, to yeah, win. Exactly. You know I mean, these are guys. Some of them have never fought before ever. Yeah. And they, you know, you ask them who served before and stuff. And it is his mindset for battle. I like how someone just IQ. from the corner. I was fighting with you in this this <laughs> battle, whatever. Oh, okay. I, I, ser I serve with you and Linda Bohan. It's it like, and then yeah. someone said, "I follow you on Facebook." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, the modern day gladiator. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen your Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> your TikTok is amazing. <laughs> wow. Yeah, how is like, yeah, comparing those days, it's crazy. Mm. It's crazy when you mentioned as well, like how it was before the all the social media, how how different it was when you were stuck yeah. in, in France and the yeah, airport yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Um, and another film, um, yeah, so the uh, the Braveheart is yeah. probably as well one of the ageless, yeah. craziest yeah. films. Looking in the stunt stuff on fighting, you're like, oh my God, you want to yeah, close yeah, your eyes. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what did you think about uh, his accent, Irish accent? Awful, uh, Scottish <laughs> accent. Scottish, sorry, yeah. Scottish. Or, yeah, it wasn't wasn't too good. <laughs> yeah, everyone is keep saying that, yeah. but like, because I don't really feel the difference. I'm like, mm, as long as I understand him. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I don't think um, I don't think he really cares, does he? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that film was such a success, such success. And again, insane. it is a lot of it is you know is not exactly hist historically correct no. either, is it? No, you know what it's I mean? about but not giving up. It's about staying yeah, to your truth. Yes, exactly, and you know, be willing to die. Uh, for a belief, yeah, you know what I mean, yeah, yeah that that, and again, the, his his mindset for battle, the fight IQ, mm. just like in Gladiator, you know how he planned his battles and this that, you know, fighting. You can't 
go and go into a fight and just see what happens mm. in my eyes. You need to take GSP, the greatest mis- martial artist ever to live. I love GSP. GSP, yeah. I, b- I was just listening to his uh, podcast with Joe Rogan. Yeah. Really, His really mind, cool his stuff. brain for fighting is second to none. Yeah. Second to none. You know, he... How he how he trained and how he fought was so clever. You know, what I mean, having a fight, I can see I, I see it all the time with great great guys rolling with each other. You know, and they keep getting caught in the same thing, and it's understanding why you're getting caught in that same thing. Mm-hmm. How about you have a fight with you? You know, what I mean, when when you fight someone, when you get everyone researches people. You know, you know you're going to fight a, a, a world class leg locker. Why are you going to play legs with him? Yeah. yeah, some people will. Some people will just just roll how I normally roll. Well, you got to have a plan for that. And GSP has class. that first. Uh, he was the first one who's used that method, frame by frame, looking yes. at the fi- fighting and punches. Yeah. I and mean, stuff. you look at when he fought um, Josh Koscheck. Hmm. You know, he knows how good Josh is wrestling as they fought before. What do I do for 25 minutes? I jab him to death. Yeah. Keep him at the end of that for 25 minutes where he can't shoot in on me. Yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. It's just, yeah, it was a bit of a boring fight, but he doesn't care when he's cashing his million dollar check and he's got his UFC world weight championship over his shoulder. Yeah, and yeah, he's, yeah. I'm off, see you later. Yeah. No, when yeah. I lived in Vancouver and did Capoeira for two two years, um, actually shout out if Marcus ever going to see it, my coach Marcus Aurelius, he was actually fighting in uh, MMA. He was one of the only Capoeiristas who was purely using Capoeira style, beating people up. Mm. He knocked uh, two guys out with Mia Lua kick, which is like a sweep. When you do sweep low, but like lift it up, it's yeah. like this crazy uh, with your with your with your heel kick in the face. Um, so when I did Capoeira there, everyone would have their nicknames. My nickname was GSP because <laughs> I was I was bold and I was pretty built. And I and I walk in the gym. Oh, you look like GSP. <laughs> like, at the time, I didn't know who GSP is. <laughs> I was like, okay. How do you not know? He's the one of the best. I was like, okay. <laughs> cool. Listen, um, how are we doing with the time? Do you have to run? I uh, still got another 15, 20, mate. Another 15, 20. So I'm going to reset the camera so we're going to do 15 minutes. No worries. Yeah. And we back. Oh, God. Do you like my hat, by the way? I do, mate. I'm a big fan of Deadpool. Oh, I'm the biggest to prove you. Look, on oh, the microphone's way. Wait, wait, wait. Where's my t shirt? <coughs> Oh no, I, oh, I put the wrong t-shirt on. <laughs> I literally, I, Uh-oh, outtake. Yeah, no, that, that's, his, uh, that's from the uh, Bond, yeah. uh, Never Time to Die. Did you see the film? I've not seen no it. Time I'm, I'm, to, I'm a Bond fan. Never Time to Die, no time Jesus to die. Christ. I'm going to get... Um, uh, were, yeah, were, you, so, were you in that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, turn totally, yeah, I was uh, basically playing one of the standees who runs in, gets killed off, and then I lie on the floor for two weeks of shooting. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then I keep asking like why are you checking my costume and everything I'm just lying on the floor. It's like no 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 but just in case and then you come to camera all you see is my foot. I'm just like that's where the big stunts are happening. Big money. Um so as a last segment or right before you you dash off to do what you do in PT session. Yeah, I got a PT and in classes to teach at Andy so I'll get back to teach one of my favorite students Danny. I've, I've PT there for five years. She's a brown belt. Really, really nice girl. Nice. Really, really nice. And then uh, I teach a class straight after that. Go home, chill with the family, and I'll be back up for Andy's for five for comp class, and then I'll leave Andy's about quarter to nine. Um, for those who pr- probably would like to know your schedule, tell me about your schedule. You literally, you live in a gym. <laughs> <laughs> That's his schedule. Uh, I do, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I've got a wife that understands and supports me, you know. Uh, without her, I wouldn't be anywhere. You know, she's uh, she's my rock. Um, so it's your wife and four kids. Four kids, yeah, yeah. What are the ages? Uh, so Ben's thirteen, Maddie's eleven, uh, Tegan is five, and Isabel's two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so quite spread out. And they're all going to do BJJ, obviously. Uh, the f- two of the girls already do. Tegan and Maddie already do the grand yeah. white belts. They do it all the time. And they're happy to do it, or they just oh, they don't have it. choice. No, 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 they love it. No, <laughs> they, they sort of didn't have a choice to start. But it got to the point where you know I, I teach on a Tuesday, and they would just come with, with me for that, and I have Friday nights off. But Tegan started going on a Friday on her own mm-hmm, now because mm-hmm. she enjoys it that much. That's awesome. I mean, she absolutely loves it. And That's then awesome. Isabel, Isabel will do it when she's um, older. Ben, unfortunately, because he's he suffers from uh, cerebral palsy, so he's wheelchair bound. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, he can't do it. But he, when he did when he was younger, and I could lift him up and move him around, he loves rough and tumble. He loves having a f- having a ruck with his dad yeah. and that sort of stuff. But the, I want all three girls to to do it, even just for confidence and self defense. You know what I mean? For later on in life and stuff, mm-hmm. or bullies in school, yeah. Yeah. Fuck yeah. <laughs> so with with Ben, um, how was it like? W- it's I, I th- I, it's difficult for me to talk about that because I don't know much about it, and yeah. I can just imagine how challenging it, it must be. Yeah, it's not. You know, you can't live a normal life yeah. at all. You know, um, when he was uh, when he was born, everything was fine. We thought it, you know perfectly normal. Mm-hmm. 
uh, obviously it was our first child and we thought um he just weren't doing things like rolling over sitting up mm-hmm. and he was a happy kid and uh, my missus you know the brains of the outfit it was always like I'm, I'm a bit well a bit concerned and me being a guy oh he's just lazy he's a boy mm-hmm. he's taking his time and then we ended up um taking him to the the doctors they referred us to a specialist and then we got an mri done and then um then yeah, it was confirmed that he had brain damage so my missus went into premature labor uh, during her pregnancy and they stopped it and they reckon that's when the damage was caused yeah and then um, so he's um, Ben can't walk he can't uh, you know support himself uh, in any way shape or form really you know um, he, he, he gets pushed around the wheelchair and stuff uh, you got you know he's getting a big we've got a lot of special equipment at home we've had to have a home you know changed for him he sleeps downstairs he's got his own little bedroom wet room downstairs you know what I mean and um, but He's the happiest, most sarcastic, funniest guy you'll ever meet in your life. The kid has got a brain on him like there's no mm. tomorrow. You know, talk about films. He's a he's a movie buff. Mm. You know, if I said to him what colour shoes was this guy wearing in ET and he could tell you exactly what colour they are. You know, wow. who, who directed what, who starred in what. When I told him you were a stuntman, we spent about three hours going through your Instagram and me showing <laughs> his favourite one is the one where you're fighting on the bridge and you get thrown off the hey, bridge. Hey, nice. You know what I mean? And he did, I did tell me to ask you, uh, did it hurt? And I said, probably, but the man's made of steel, so he probably didn't No, you it. can not tell him that your class has hurt way more. <laughs> that didn't hurt at all. <laughs> but he, he is obsessed with stuff like that, obsessed with film. Wow. You know, yeah, he's, he's a proper movie buff, movie buff. He wants to be a puppeteer when he's older. He loves the Muppets. Mm. He's obsessed with the Muppets and that. But, um, yeah, you know, I would have loved him for him to continue and do jiu-jitsu like me, but it is what it is. And, you know, it, it, the toughest thing is, is like my missus now, obviously it's half term. She's got all four kids. She can't just go, oh, let's go to soft play. or oh, let's go to town. Mm. Because Ben can't do these things. He can't go in a soft play. You know, he's just too big for Michaela to pick up now. So, um, you know, we've got a really good sort of uh, routine. Your missus should get in CrossFit. <laughs> yeah, so stuff. start carrying him around, bless her. She's, only, she's really, really short as well, Michaela. But, um, <laughs> you know, but it's tough. Yeah, we can't live normal lives, but we make it work and we're happy. I won't change it for the world. No, you know what I mean? <clears throat> anytime I looked up on your Instagram and whenever you post stuff, you guys are just smiling. And, yeah, it's the and best it's, way to be. It's very, very impressive. Um. You also mentioned that you had a situation with your own health. Yes, yeah. Um, God, that was a that was a shock to the system. Uh, back in 2020, uh, I fought on a big show called Grapple Fest, and uh, I got back home on the Monday, and uh, I had like a growth on my face mm-hmm. about three or four months beforehand. It was like a scar I had for years, and it started bleeding. And I thought I just got a scratch on my face training. You know, it was mm-hmm. like when we're wrestling. I was training nonstop, competing nonstop, and um, it was sort of heat up. And then I'd scratch it and it just turned to a scab and come off again. I thought, mm-hmm. yeah, just because I'm training. My missus, you know what women are like? Go to the doctors. Nah, nah, I'll be all right. Go to the doctors. I'll be all right. So months went by. And I just thought, it's just because I'm training, it's not healing. But it would heal up and then just come mm-hmm. back. So I got back from Grapple Fest on the Sunday and she said to me, oh, I've booked your appointment to the doctor Tuesday morning. You go in. I was like, okay. You know, I'm sort of some sort of eczema or something like that. You know, skin condition, I'll get some cream. And I, I go to the doctors, everything's normal. The doctor sort of looks at me and goes, oh, yeah. Um, I think it might be skin cancer. I was like, "Sorry, what?" And he goes, he, "I goes, you sure?" I said, like, it might, you know, "Is it not like some, you know, this that?" He goes, "No, no, I'm pretty sure it's this. I need to refer you to a dermatologist." And this was February 2020. Mm-hmm. So I walk out and I phone Michaela, and I said to her, "You know, oh, he thinks it might be skin cancer." She's like, "All right, okay, okay, all right, all right. Um, I'm just having my lashes done. I'll um, I speak to you in a bit." No, no. Uh, so um, okay, so um, I go to Sainsbury's. And I sit in the car park at Sainsbury's. I buy a can of Red Bull. I like a Red Bull. Um, and uh, she phones me back, crying her eyes out, going, it hit me like a punch in the face, a shock. I didn't understand what you've just said, and I've just taken in what you've just told me. Crying her eyes out. And I said, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll chat when you get home. Don't rush. Don't change anything that you're doing. Just be normal. And then two hours pass, I'm still sat in my car. <laughs> and I'm just staring into the space. You know, you think. The first thing for me was, am I going to see my kids get married? Are they going to see them have kids? Are they going to grow up with a granddad? So we go home, we discuss a few things, and then two days later, I get my dermatology appointment through. And uh, this is August. It's going to be August, August 25th. I remember it because it's my son's birthday. And I'm thinking, it's February. I can't wait that long. You know what? Well, you know, and then two weeks later, COVID kicked in. We get locked down. So I'm thinking, how the hell am I going to get to see a doctor? Uh, so I decide to go private. And I find the best skin specialist in the South, uh, a doctor, and he's, he runs a clinic in Frimley Park Hospital, Parkside, the private place once a week. So I go in, and him in seconds, he looked at me and said, yeah, this is skin cancer. And he goes, what I need to do now is take a, a biopsy, confirm it before I can remove it. He said, because it's so close, it's here on the side of my cheek. 
Mm -hmm. Because it's so close to your eye, I can't remove it. It has to be done by a plastic surgeon. Because if I do it, your eye will hang. Mm -hmm. he said, you know, so we get the biopsy done, go from there. So a couple of weeks go by, we're locked down and I stop working. So I start, my mind starts going, I start suffering from anxiety. God, at one minute I'm fine, next minute I'm going to die. Mm. You know, I got, I got no outlet, I had a jiu-jitsu taken off me. So I'm stuck at home with this Jeez. in my head. It was, it was hell on earth. And then uh, I get the biopsy done. And two weeks later, this confirmed, yep, it is, it is this, this, that and the other. We'll pass you on to a plastic surgeon. So I got, um, uh, preferred to have got a Dr. Parabi. Incredible person, incredible guy. And uh, he says, look, I'm having to close the clinic because we've got to go and help deal with the stress of COVID and this, that, and the other. But I've got one appointment left, and it's on this night. So obviously, with my missus, I had to go on my own, open surgery on my own. So I went down there. And, uh, you know, he said, yep, it is what it is. Uh, I can operate now. We can take, remove it from your face. We do another biopsy and see if we got it. And um, so, you know, they lay me down, numb all my face, cuts my face open. He pulls it all apart, stitches it up, patches me up. Sits down with me for half an hour, has a chat, makes sure I'm all right, and sends me on my way. It's two weeks pass, so I don't know whether they got it. If they haven't got it, they've got yeah, to open up more yeah. of my face. You know what I mean? So I'm going through hell right now at home. No no jujitsu, no outlet. I'm just stuck indoors, you know. And uh, we're going to take the dogs for a walk on the Monday, and uh, I get a phone call from his receptionist saying, oh, hello, Mr. Butler, how are you? Uh, you know, I spoke to Dr. Parabi. He says, uh, uh, am I, are you expecting a phone call, or did he ask you to make an appointment? I was like, oh, he said, you phoned me after two weeks. I goes, why are my results in? She goes, yeah. And I goes, oh, can you tell me them? She goes, oh, I'm not allowed to. And I was just like, if I had hair, he'd be being pulled out. I went ape shit. So I hung up and uh, I said, he's supposed to phone me. And then Michaela phoned him back and said, you can't do that to him. He's under so much stress, anxiety, depression. He's lost his job. You know, you're telling him. She goes, I'm really sorry, but, you know. So he, he comes to Friday and he's, I'm expecting his call on this Friday. He gets to about five o'clock and my phone rings and it, and, it, and it comes up his name. So at this point, my heart is doing a million miles oh an hour. Oh my God. And I, I don't know if my life's going to change forever or I can walk downstairs and go, oh, I can get on with my life. And he answers the phone, Hermes, about how are you? Because I'm okay. He goes, good news. That's the first thing he says to me. We don't know no small talk. Good news. Straight away. Yeah, he knows, I was just he like, I was like, oh, what? And he goes, uh, completely excised, gone. It's not on your face. You know, uh, we got it. We got it all. It hasn't spread. You're absolutely. It's going to be absolutely fine. And he talked to me about what's going to happen now. You know, PTSD, depression, anxiety of it coming back. You know, and um, I said to him before he went, I said, you know, what what do I do now? And he says, look, it's hard as going to be. Forget about it. Forget it ever happened. You know, wear the scar on your face and just forget about it. Okay. And he said, you know, you've got my number. Anything else happens, don't go through the path you went through last time. It's going to be cheaper. Just come and see me. And we'll, we'll sort it out. And I walked downstairs, and Mrs. is crying. The kids are like, because they understood what was going on, the old ones. And I said, oh, you know, it's gone all clear. And uh, yeah, celebrate for two weeks. You know? <laughs> and then um, and then, then the PTSD sets in, you know, and the depression and the anxiety. Father's Day, Father's Day, man. I was, um, this, 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 was, this is the worst bit. It's not about having a disease, it's what's after, even to this day. You know, I'm still not training, still not doing my thing. And I'm in the toilet after going out for dinner for, for Father's Day. The bit of restaurant started opening up. And I look in the mirror and I've got a spot on the other side of my cheek. I collapse. Just couldn't leave. My missus had to come up and knock at the bathroom door. You know, what's going on? So, you know, I thought I had it again. It come back. Everything come flushing back. And then from that moment onwards, dude, every little thing with my body, I'm in the yeah. mirror. I'm, I've been in and, out, in and out of the doctors about a million times. It's only over the last two, two and a half months, three months, that I've balanced out a bit more. Mm. I've stopped suffering as much, man. Yeah, horrible, horrible experience. You know, a friend of mine who who has got a rare blood uh, cancer, he basically lives three months at a time. Every three months he goes to a specialist and they tell him if he's got another three months. And he said, he's, he said this really, really mad quote, and uh, you know, I couldn't agree more. He said, you're part of a club you don't want to be part of, you know. But he said, people don't understand what it's like until they've been told that word, that one word, because you instantly think that's it, it's game over for me. Yeah. yeah, so that was probably my biggest ever battle. But my wife, <coughs> my friends, you know, Connor, Ta uh, Cam, and and Tomo, and all that, all supported me. You know, Lawrence, Chris, all these guys that looked after me and helped me, and you know, uh, started PTs again with me, get me some income, playing jiu doing jiu jitsu again. You know, I wouldn't be here without any of that lot. And uh, my wife and my kids, especially like Michaela's support. You know, you're gonna be all right. You're gonna be all right. You know, stay strong and. Yeah, man, and I'm, I'm here today, happy as Larry, living the best life. Get to meet characters like yourself, you know, and teach jiu-jitsu. 
it's a uh, it's been a it's been an incredible journey and i had to deal with that all through lockdown after losing my job <laughs> you know but um, i got through it and i feel i feel good now you know yeah <clears throat> i don't all i can say that these kind of experiences they definitely make us in a sense of like yes. build our characters and uh, as, as horrible they are and um you know talking about cancer i had one person in in, uh, in my life who um this amazing up and coming actor who used to be a fighter actually he used to be maybe you know him his name is uh um uh smith uh luke smith hmm. um and he uh, came to me one day and he said like um yeah i have i have cancer so he said like he has the blood blood cancer and i i didn't even know what to say yeah. i was like this is like because you know you don't hear a lot of stories that people come out of it yeah. and his was diagnosed very very late like yeah. he was like a fourth stage or something because mm-hmm. the hospital made a mistake uh, it's but anyways with this guy he just went through it and and i even have a video where he's fighting uh with me bare knuckle fight for this one film in a mid uh, it's mid winter uh with a with a uh, uh, rain machines. We're all covered in in, in, in rain. And he's bold, not because he's shaved, but because hair fell yeah, out. Yeah, for the chemo. And we're doing the fight. Yeah, that's incredible. And like, and then literally a couple months later, he came out clean, and he's clean now, and he's he's been living life. Continue. It may tell you what it changes your perspective on life. You know, you feel like you've got a second chance. You know, mm. um, I, I made a promise to myself of certain things that I want to do with my life that I'm going to do, and no one's going to stop me. And I'm more blunt with people. I speak my mind. You know, you don't want to have an argument with someone and say, or, or say to someone, I think you're a bit of a dickhead. You know what I mean? And yeah. you go for like, oh, I should have said that to him. Yeah. Now I just speak my mind openly yeah. with people because I feel like, you know, I might not be here tomorrow. Yeah. You know, you don't know what's going to happen. And this is the thing, like, when we, you know, get these adversities, like, you know, cancer, disease, whatever. But the thing is, like, we can be gone tomorrow. Yeah. Just because we drive, we do all these things, you know, and, and you know, <sighs> It's it's uh, it's sad that we need those kind of eye openers for yeah. a lot of us yes, to definitely. actually live our lives, you know. And that's why for me, my mantra is: um, I'm gonna die. The only thing I can take with me is my experience, and yeah. I can do everything I can in my power just to have as crazy and cool experiences. And that's why I do. I started this yeah. because I would never know this story. I would never. You probably. I would still come and see you. You coach me hmm. when we would sit down and you tell me about these kind of things. Hmm. You know, and then also, and when we tell these stories, and when right now we're in such an amazing time, and we can share with these stories, and people who don't know you very well now they will be able to see this and they see see the story of what you have to share, yeah, and everyone can learn from it. Listen, before we wrap up, before you uh, you get fired from your job, <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any any wisdom? I mean, like we already covered so many cool things, but any suggestions for someone? Let's let's just go focus on someone who just starting BJJ journey. Yeah, I, I've got I've got the quote of quotes, and this was said to me by you know my my former coach James Hardy, and he said this to me when I was a white belt, and I made this speech because when you get a black belt in jiu-jitsu, you got to make your speech, yeah, mm, mm. Uh, and it's really short, but it's st- stuck with me, and it's so true for pretty much anything in life. Yeah, you get out what you put in. Oh, yeah, you get out what you put in. The more you're willing to put into jiu-jitsu, the more you're going to get out of it. You know, for your social life, your physical uh, abilities, you know, y- your training, your technique. The more you pile into that sport, the more it will give you. For instance meeting you you know your line of work uh, I'm saying I'm a, my, me and my family, son are obsessed with stunts you know I can not talk to you about that you know I wouldn't have met you unless I put my soul into jiu-jitsu and become an instructor mm-hmm. you know uh, meeting people like George Asprey you know Scar in The Lion King you know being on a West End stage funny enough I uh, yeah so the uh, uh, was it John John Asprey? Sean. Sean. Uh, sorry, George, Sean. George. George. George Asprey. Yeah. And, I was and actually Sean just Scoffy. I just uh, saw on on uh, on TV just came up uh, or um, online came up the uh, Lion King's um, a commercial, and yeah, I yeah. could just recognize his yeah, face yeah, yeah, there. Yeah. And then I follow his Instagram. He brings people to do to train yes, on the yeah, stage. Uh, yes, and I was one of the first people he ever had on the stage, and he's had insane. everyone from Braulio and Mauricio. And all that, you know, it's like that. I you know, piled my entire life and soul into jiu-jitsu and what it has given me. And it's like I will never, ever take for granted. The mm. people that are in my life and uh, the people that have uh, supported me and what I've got from it. So the more you put into it, man, the more you're going to get out of it. And just and don't stop. Just don't stop. And it's with everything. And that's this is probably the biggest lesson for our kids as well, for you, yeah. a young and upcoming. And when they say, why can't I get this work? And did you put your work in it? Yeah. Yeah, hard work pays off all yeah. the time. It's saying that, you know, I've never been academically clever. 
you know what I mean? Uh, I, you know, I left school at an early age, but I grafted. I, I'm not afraid of grafting. I'm not afraid to get up at six in the morning and work all day. You know, you said you said about my schedule earlier on. It's pretty much six in the morning, you know, before I start to slow down a bit. So like nine, ten at night, like my typical Tuesday before I teach you guys. Hmm. I'm at Andy's at six in the morning, you know, until about one o'clock. I'll go home, do the school run. I'm back at Andy's for half three, teach till quarter to eight go straight to Pride, teach you guys, and I get back in my door at 10 o'clock, and then I'm back at Andy's for 8 the next morning. I pretty much do that every day. But that's because that's I love it. I'm lucky. I'm lucky that I get to do what I love for a living. But like yourself, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and people, I, people might say to you, oh, you know, how did you get that role? How did you get into this? It's because I worked my ass off, mate. Mm. And, I, and, you know, you've got to say to yourself sometimes, I deserve that because I've worked for it. And sometimes I don't, I don't say that enough to myself, you know. Maybe yeah. I do deserve these things because of what I do, not just for me, but what I do for other people. And people closest to me will, will vouch for that, the stuff I do that people don't see for people. Mm. You know? And I, I never ask for anything back. That is my pleasure, helping other people. Okay, before wrapping up, uh, quickly, where how uh, people who listen to you, how we can find you? Uh, my biggest thing is my Instagram, uh, Jay Butler. At Jay Butler, BJJ, I post up everything on there, pretty much everything yeah. I do from my family life to my jiu-jitsu moves where I teach. You know, I like to be very vocal on my Instagram. And that's the same thing, Jay Butler on YouTube, Jay Butler on Facebook. Yeah. So everything is the same. Uh, any shout outs before? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's do the shout-outs. Always, always get the shout-outs. Let's We're do the shout-outs. Shout, shout, shout out my sponsors, uh, Tatami Fightwear. They've looked after me for like nearly five years now. Absolute brilliant clothing brand. My, my, you know, my brothers in arms, Connor Campbell. Uh, world class brown belt, Cameron Bereton, world class brown belt, Tom most dope strong. The Tom the, the, is the purple insane. Belt. I, I can I can uh, add to shout out. So now he wears everything purple. So his shoes are purple, <laughs> and then I'm just like, I can't wait when you get a brown belt. Yeah, because he won't wear as much brown. Are I you gonna him, wear yeah. everything brown, <laughs> you weirdo? <laughs> you know, and and obviously my wife Michaela and my kids. You know, yeah, it's awesome. Awesome man, listen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming over and sharing with all of this. And then uh, we that's it for us. Little dance check. (laughs) Show me your dance check. My very good as yours, man. Hey, (laughs) awesome.